Hey everyone, Mif here, and welcome to my playthrough of the Baldur's Gate saga with SCS done in a completionist style. If that didn't tell you much, do not worry. I'm going to explain everything, and that's the point of this video. This is episode zero, not the proper start to the playthrough yet. This is just an introductory video uh, where I can take the opportunity to talk about a variety of topics related to this Let's Play. And if you want to uh, skip straight to the gameplay, then feel free to go directly to episode 1 and we'll meet in Candlekeep, I guess. But if you'd uh, like to stay a while and listen in my butchered <laughs> Deckard Cain impersonation, uh, well, I uh, invite you to keep watching. I'll try to make this interesting. Uh, by the way, this is probably going to be a pretty long video, so don't get mad at me if this ends up being like an hour-long watch. Uh, I kind of want to be brief, but on the other hand, I'd like to be—I'd like to go quite in depth uh, when it comes to some of the topics that I would like to discuss. So we'll see how this goes, I guess. I will put timestamps in the description of this video to help you navigate in between the topics if you don't want to uh, watch everything. Uh, and I would put annotations in this video if uh, YouTube didn't discontinue that feature, I guess. So that is pretty unfortunate that there's not going to be any any annotations anymore. And I could, I could use them in this video. Anyway, uh, I would like to talk about three main categories of, of topics in this video. Uh, first, uh, some info about the playthrough itself, why I'm doing this, what's this completionist idea, um, and just some more specific aspects of the playthrough. And then the second category, I would like to talk about some technical info, uh, why Enhanced Edition, and more importantly, why this version of en en Enhanced Edition 1.3 that I'm playing on, because that's going to be pretty important. And finally, the mods I'm going to be running in, in this playthrough, because they are extremely, extremely uh, crucial to this, this whole uh, Let's Play. And then uh, lastly, I would like to talk about some character creation uh, related uh, topics. Like we're going to go first through the character creation process, which will allow me to uh, explain some of the stats and mechanics and all that. And then I'm going to show you the two characters that I've made for this playthrough. And yes, uh, we're going to play with two characters made by the, the player, I guess, in this, in this Let's Play. And I'm just going to talk about them, my decisions when it comes to setting them up, and uh, their planned development throughout the saga, because they will not stay as they are uh, now. Alright, so the, the, the first category, let's talk about the, the, the playthrough. And I know what you're thinking. Yet another Baldur's Gate video. And that's clearly what YouTube needs, right? Slash sarcasm. And I understand that argument, but I also have two things to say um, to that. Well, f first of all, uh, Baldur's Gate Saga, the Baldur's Gate games, as I usually punch them up, uh, are by far, like without a doubt, my uh, number one favorite games. So I've always known that I would make this playthrough at some point, regardless of the circumstances. Because, you know, there's a million different great features about Baldur's Gate games, but what I like to what I like to do in this playthrough, what I like to focus on, I guess, is the, the aspect of Baldur's Gate that some games from the 90s and 80s have, which is, Baldur's Gate is one of these games that are like, super rich in content. They have so much depth and complexity, that pretty much, no matter how much you've played them, how much you've watched other people play them, and how much you've read about them, there's always, every once in a while, something new to learn about them. You're probably going to, you know, discover something new if you do something slightly different in your playthrough, and discover that there's a different outcome to that. Or maybe you watch a playthrough of someone and, and learn something new, or maybe read on the forums about some cool trick. Like, it's basically an endless well <laughs> that you can just keep taking out some bits of, of info every once in a while and learn new stuff. And um, that's basically kind of the idea. I would like to showcase everything that this game has to offer. Um, although, of course, this is pretty much impossible to know everything about the game, and I surely don't claim to know everything about the game, but I know a few things, and I would just like to make this kind of a tribute to this game, as dorky as it sounds. 
Uh, but yeah, I would like to just showcase as much as it has to offer. And I just hope I will not forget too many things as I go through the areas and through the game in general. And um, yeah, I'd like to be informative in this playthrough. That's that's the attempt I'm going to make, and that's kind of the theme I would like to have for my whole channel, to focus on games that I feel like I'm knowledgeable enough uh, about. This playthrough is also going to be you know, done in this completionist style, which I'm going to explain in a second. And the difficulty of this playthrough is also going to be a pretty important factor, provided mostly by the mod SCS, which I'm also going to elaborate on uh, in a second. So anyway, when it comes to the more specific data or info about the playthrough, uh, just to be clear, it's going to be the classic saga, so Baldur's Gate 1 with Tales of the Sword Coast, Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Am, and uh, Throne of Ball. No Siege of Dragonspear silliness. Like, I've never felt like there was a gap that needed to be filled between the Baldur's Gate games. Like, when you uh, start Baldur's Gate 2, you get a perfect explanation about what happened, and when it comes to that particular character, that particular story, you can fill in any gaps with your imagining of, you know, what happens when it comes to the details. And um, this is also re related to the, <laughs> to the patch uh, 2.0 that I think I would be forced to play with Seed of Dragonspear, and then just in general knowing the quality of Beamdog's original writing, I just wasn't interested in it. Uh, Alright, so let's talk about this completionist uh, idea. I actually initially struggled a little bit when it comes to its name, because it's not going to be a true 100% playthrough, but it's going to be a playthrough in, in the spirit of that. So basically, uh, in order to showcase like 100% of what Baldur's Gate has to offer, it's pretty much impossible, but if you just... And you would need at least two playthroughs for that, but if you wanted to cram as much as possible in just one playthrough, that would have to include some really tedious to watch, like very unenjoyable to watch things, I think. Uh, because, for example, in Baldur's Gate 2, that would have to involve every companion quest, um, and probably every stronghold quest line, because there are mods that allow you to have all of the strongholds. And uh, I've done playthroughs like that in, before, and basically what ends up happening uh, to me that, well, first of all, let's talk about these quests. They are kind of secondary quests in nature that um, are just supposed to remind you of, of themselves every once in a while, because how they're structured is uh, that an event happens in the quest line, and then usually it's four days of in-game time later, and sometimes a little bit more, and sometimes there's a certain condition that has to be met as well, like you have to rest outdoors or something. But usually, like, four days after that of in-game time, uh, the other, like, the next event in that quest chain happens. Like, for example, a messenger spawns and delivers some kind of uh, message to you. And then you go do that, what's required, and then, again, you have to wait for, like, four or five days, or around a week of in-game time sometimes, and, you know, the next thing happens. So basically what happens to me in, in those playthroughs is that I'm long done with everything else, and then I'm just artificially kind of fast-forwarding in-game time by mass resting and just waiting for these events to pop up and then, and then I just go do what's required and then I rest again and go do what's required and so on and so forth. So I don't think that would be particularly entertaining to watch. However, the whole spirit of a 100% uh, playthrough here is, is going to be pretty important. So I would like to do a playthrough that's kind of like a 100% playthrough so it involves it's going to involve doing all quests like exploring all of the areas um, creating all and upgrading all of the weapons in Baldur's Gate 2 and Throne of Baal uh, that kind of thing and just basically you know like I said showcasing everything that this game has to offer and especially focusing on the lesser known like bits and pieces Easter eggs and stuff like that but with two limitations and the first one is going to be in regards to my party uh, my companions, I guess, and the second one is going to be in regards to my character's alignment. So the first one relates to what I just said about companions. I don't have to uh, be forced to recruit every one of them and do their personal quest. Uh, I will recruit quite a few companions temporarily before I settle for my final party, but, uh, you know, around the mid-game or so I would like to settle for my final party and just go through the rest of the game with them, leveling them up, gearing them up, and so on. And the second uh, limitation 
my character's alignment. What I mean here is that well, my character's going to be good aligned, uh, chaotic good alignment, uh, to be precise. And I just want to be consistent in that character's choices, which means that, you know, I want to do things the good way. I want to solve quests uh, by doing the, the good solution to them and, and so on. I don't want to have to do an evil thing just because it would maybe uh, yield better rewards or show a little bit more content. It's usually the other way around. It's usually when you play an evil character that you would miss out on a lot of stuff. Sometimes when you go with an option that only evil characters can engage in. Sometimes you can miss out on experience or some rewards. Uh, but there are also s things like that for a good aligned character. For example, in Baldur's Gate 2 and Watcher's Keep, on level 3, the maze level, there are two groups of fiends, one group of demons and one group of devils that are engaged in, a, in the blood war. And normally you can strike a deal with either of these groups to bring the heart of the leader of the opposing group to the one you're bargaining with. But if you're good aligned, uh, this conversation is only going to progress up until a certain point in which the demon is going to sense, <laughs> as it's usually in uh, the case in RPG games, that they're going to sense that you're a good person and they're just not going to trust you and they're going to back out of the, out of the deal. So that means that we cannot do this quest and more importantly we can't get the reward for it, which is a thief's hood that can be later upgraded by Sespinar. So, you know, that's something that you will just miss out on. Or, for example, we cannot keep Black Razor, a very good long sword. So basically, if you wanted to really, like, cram as much as possible in one playthrough, you'd have to pretty much go with a, a neutral aligned character and just pick and choose when it comes to the quest on a, like, case-by-case -case basis, I guess, uh, what kind of solution to the quest to do. Um, you know, basically to ensure that you're getting the best rewards or the most amount of content or something like that, which I don't want to do. Now, the one exception to the consistency of my choices is going to be in Baldur's Gate 2 when it comes to, like, an Easter egg, such an iconic thing about Baldur's Gate that I just have to show it off. I'm referring to the Pantaloon, uh, kind of Easter egg. It's not really a quest, but it's something, an element of the game that spans all across the saga. It's basically about collecting pairs of pantaloons as you go through the saga. Uh, in Baldur's Gate 1 you can get the golden pantaloons, in Baldur's Gate 2 you can get the silver pantaloons, and in Throne of Baal you can get the bronze pantalets. And then when you have all three, there's a, a payoff to that. There's kind of a conclusion to the whole thing. And uh, in Baldur's Gate 2, in Shadows of An, when it comes to the silver pantaloons, I think a lot of people missed out on those, as I did on my first playthrough, because it involves doing an evil thing. So if you were playing a good character, you probably had no idea where to find those pantaloons. And there is kind of a workaround, there is kind of a thing where you can get the silver pantaloons without getting the minus reputation that comes with it, so I might do that, but that's just going to be the exception, like, for the greater good, I guess, as much as I hate that expression, to, you know, showcase this incredible incredibly important and like iconic thing with the pantaloons. We will have to do one evil thing, but generally I, I will not do uh, things like that. Alright, so the difficulty of the playthrough is going to be provided mostly by SCS, which I'm going to talk about at length in the uh, second category. All I'm going to say is that uh, when it comes to the difficulty level, oh wow, we actually get to click something here. Uh, I'm going to play on core difficulty, which if we move the slider here, it's basically just Baldur's Gate 1 rules, um, you know, it's based on the Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, on this engine, with Enhanced Edition, it's the 2.5 version, basically. And I just want to talk about why core, and not go to hard or insane. As you can see in Baldur's Gate, uh, once you go higher with the difficulty slider, all it does is make you take more damage, either 50% or double damage. And basically, in Baldur's Gate 2 I find it more acceptable, but in Baldur's Gate 1 I just don't like how it ends up uh, playing out. It's an interesting challenge, but uh, for a Let's Play I don't think it would be interesting at all to watch, because it basically forces you to like excessively kite for uh, quite a long time in the game, before you build up a health pool, because uh, you know Baldur's Gate 1 is a low-level adventure, you start at level 1, so a lot of classes have actually, um, you know, pretty much all classes really, until you get like 2-3 levels at least, 
uh, to build up your health pool, uh, you're basically running the risk of just getting essentially one-shotted. Or, well, there is kind of a rule when you're uh, on level 1, if you're uninjured, you cannot get killed in one hit. But uh, once you, you are not uninjured, so for example you have one less HP than your max, or if you progress to level 2, you can get one-shotted, and with double damage, this is going to be the case. <laughs> and even on level 2 or 3, you know, just two or three quick hits and it can be a disaster. So basically you have to run kind of like an Icewind Dale 2 uh, Heart of Winter mode party, where you have like one decoy and five archers to uh, just kite monsters with that one decoy character and uh, kill every everything from the distance with your archers. Something like that. And it's kind of, like I said, an interesting way to play, but not really applicable for a a uh, playthrough like this, uh, I think. And in Baldur's Gate 2, I find it more acceptable because it really adds to um, the difficulty level in some encounters, so I might put it onto Insane in Baldur's Gate 2. But usually, uh, aside from certain encounters where, where they really punish you for not... Uh, preparing appropriately, like some spells are just going to one-shot you um, because you weren't like you know protected against them or something and on core you can kind of get away with such mistakes but really aside from some fights like that all it really amounts to is that you have to just heal more and rest more because uh, in fights you're going to take a hit here and there and opponents are going to be chipping away at your health and um, uh, if you're receiving double damage, then that just means you have to just kind of stop and heal more and rest more. And that's that's pretty much it. Uh, so, yeah, in Baldur's Gate 2 I might increase it to insane, but we'll see. Uh, generally I like Core, with all of its mechanics. Uh, except one, which is the randomness that comes from rolling for HP when you level up. And that's why I'm going to play with max HP. That's a component that you can get from mods or in Baldur's Gate 2 by editing the INI file. Uh, and that's basically going to ensure that I get max HP on my characters as they level up. Because I just hate the randomness uh, related to such a vital component of your character, the health pool that you have, that can get you ruined. Like, that can ruin a cool character but just not getting ro the rolls. And if you're going to save and reload to get good HP rolls, well, you might as well use max HP. But of course, you know, SCS is going to counterbalance that, and to counterbalance that even more, uh, my characters are actually going to have their constitution set up in such a way to actually not receive any HP bonuses from constitution. So they might a actually end up uh, having less HP than if I went with random rolls and like, you know, 19 constitution that you can get in Baldur's Gate 1, uh, having, you know, 5 HP per level on fighters or, or on warrior classes. Alright, so that's it when it comes to the difficulty. Now another thing uh, that needs to be mentioned, I'm going to play with a full party. That's my favorite way to play and it, it's kind of intended, although talking about what's intended in, in such an open game with Baldur, as Baldur's Gate with all of different like exploits and broken things that you can do, talking about like balance and uh, intention is kind of, you know, it, it shouldn't be taken too seriously, I guess. But uh, that's my favorite way to play, because you have six people to control, so it's the most interesting, I guess. And you also get the least amount of experience per person if you go with a full party. Um, that's just my favorite way to play, that's kind of... And I'm talking about, that, about what's intended here, because, you know, the amount of experience that you should have at certain points in the game, I guess, is... Uh, you know, some fights were, like, balanced, I guess, <laughs> with... Uh, a certain idea of what spells are going to be at your disposal, for example. And if you have a smaller party, then you can kind of out-level some of these encounters where you get access to higher level spells that can trivialize some of the encounters, but it's really, you know, the, the games are so open that I don't want to come off as, uh, like, you know, judgmental <laughs> if you want to play with a smaller party or whatever. I actually enjoy all types of playthroughs, it's just that full party I enjoy the most. I also like to play solo every once in a while, because that has a completely different feel, you know, in general. It has... it's more difficult in some ways, and it's easier in some ways, because, you know, you only have one person to do stuff with, but on the other hand, you, you level so quickly, and uh, it's also way easier to protect one person from different debilitating effects than it is to protect a whole party. The, my least favorite way to play is with a smaller party, like four people, because that kind of doesn't get the disadvantage of 
either style and gets all the advantages, kind of, because you still end up leveling faster and uh, you still have four people, which with multi-classes and dual classes especially, you, you can have access to all spells, all abilities, you can have all your bases covered, and you have four people to do stuff with, you know, you have four pairs of hands, four uh, sources of damage and sources of spells every round. Um, but yeah, talking about this, uh, well, I'm going to talk about leveling in, in a little bit, or maybe now, actually. <laughs> this is a mess. But anyway, I am fully aware that there are different like power leveling or quick leveling techniques and I'm consciously uh, not going to go for them and basically what I mean here is that you can go solo for a while or maybe with another character uh, basically with as small party as possible and just at the beginning of the playthrough just do a couple of very profitable in terms of experience uh, profitable things quests and like activities I guess to level up your character to uh, level 5, for example, quickly, and only then recruit the rest of your party, because uh, then they are going to be higher level, because every NPC in the game pretty much has like three, four versions of themselves, depending on what level you are, because the game is going to choose the version of that character uh, that's closest in level to what you are. So. Uh, you ba essentially skip a lot of, like, thousands of experience, if you do it like that, that would be needed to level a whole party from level 1. And so basically, you know, you can quickly level your character solo to level 5 or 6, and then recruit everyone else, and then your whole party is at level around level 5 or 6. So, you know, I am fully aware of activities like that, you know, you can talk to Marl in Baragos for 900, you can kill certain people like or creatures like shale or the serenes or of course the basilisks and um, you know there, there's some other things that you can do like there's this basilisk kind of exploit where you can just keep uh, keep one basilisk charmed and then just keep um, and petrifying a greater ba basilisks and then unpetrifying it with the uh, stone to flesh scroll and you can just keep doing that for 7000 experience all the time. You can go and kill Ankhags if you get a little bit more experience, you know, a slightly higher health pool and stuff like that. So there are many different uh, ways to gain a lot of experience and I'm probably going to point them out as we go through the playthrough but I'm just not going to go uh, for those. I'm going to go with a full party pretty much as early as possible and just go through the usual leveling process. And also I'm going to have some spell restrictions for my main character in Baldur's Gate 2, which I'm going to talk more once we get into Baldur's Gate 2. And uh, one more thing, I'm going to uh, use Control j which uh, if you're familiar with the game, you can actually put in kind of like a debug mode into the game that allows you to use the game console while in game and some control commands. And there's going to be just one I'm going to use every once in a while. And uh, what Control J does, if you're unfamiliar, is allows you to like teleport your uh, party on the map. And I'm only going to do that in places where I've already explored. I'm not skipping any fights. I'm not doing it to like cheat out of a situation or anything like that. It's basically just because I'm used to and I don't want to have this dead time of my party just going from one side of the map to the other. It's especially useful in towns where you need to visit a shop on one end of the town and then an inn on the other and you know just watching them walk is not the most exciting activity I guess. Alright so let's move on to the second category the technical info and first of all let's talk about the enhanced additions. Um, as a general remark I usually strongly dislike all of those HD remakes and like enhanced editions and things like that uh, that uh, have come out uh, recent in, in recent times, I guess. Because in most cases they are just cash grabs where the developers are preying on the fond memories of players, but memories that are not precise enough to spot the false advertising and basically the attempt to make a quick buck off of a really bad product. But Enhanced Edition kind of, kind of uh, when it comes to Baldur's Gate, the Enhanced Editions kind of get a pass for me. Because, um, well, I'm going to talk to <laughs> talk about that in a second. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, one thing in particular that people have a 
uh, that had a, a uh, bad start with the enhanced editions, I guess. Uh, because of the launch, <laughs> Beamdog is known for their very bug-infested launches of games. But basically I've never really experienced that because I um, picked up the Baldur's Gate enhanced editions much later, after they've been patched a couple of times. So I never really experienced any of the bugs that were already fixed by that time. And uh, most of my favorite mods were already ported onto the Enhanced Edition uh, engines, I guess. Uh, so yeah, I, I never really got that bad experience, I guess, with uh, Enhanced Edition. And also, as an important remark, it's really not a, ba not a big deal whether you play Enhanced Editions or uh, Classics. I play both on a rather regular basis, and the differences are just not too significant. Uh, when it comes to the uh, the differences, I guess, first, there are things that of course you can achieve in the classics through mods that Enhanced Edition does. So for example, you know, you can get a higher and widescreen resolution through the widescreen mod, or you can get to play Baldur's Gate 1 on the Baldur's Gate 2 engine, and there's like at least three ways, I think, to do that. And then, of course, there are the specifics, things that you can only do in the classics, and things that you can only do in the enhanced editions. So in the classics, for example, a cool thing is that you can use an utility called Tobex, or T-O-B-X, which I think stands for Throne of Ball Extended, which uh, some mods use, and basically t in order to hack the executable file of the classic Baldur's Gate games, and the uh, why it doesn't work on enhanced edition is that the enhanced editions have a different EXE file, and through that you can modify some of the hard-coded things in the game, such as, for example, the look of the stone skin spell, which, uh, you know, it makes sense that it basically gives your character like a stone gray graphic. But, you know, if you played the game a lot, and especially if you have mage-oriented teams, you kind of get tired of having that stone party of, like, statues, and you would much prefer to see the actual colors that, colors that you've assigned them and all that. Uh, another thing are some of the cool oversights, I guess, and bugs that are still present in the classic versions, like, for example, some spells that are not meant to do that, or not supposed to do that, but still bypass magic resistance, such as Sunfire, for example, the level 5 arcane spell, which makes it kind of a cooler spell, I guess, and it's more worth memorizing in that version, because in certain situations where you're facing, of course, monsters, or opponents that have high magic resistance, you can still have a tool that bypasses that. So for example, when fighting Drow, it's really cool to actually have like a spell trigger with triple Sunfire to just quickly uh, clean out a big group, especially useful when you're doing the Siege of Ustnatha part of SCS or something like that. So that's unfortunate that uh, Enhanced Edition fixed that. And then there's also like some mods, that there's very few some mods that you can't use on Enhanced Edition. Uh, additions, I guess. Some mods that are only usable in the classic version. I think Tactics is probably the biggest one. I, I am aware that there were um, some people kind of trying to port Tactics over to Enhanced Edition, but I kind of... Maybe they've uh, succeeded, I guess. But I kind of stopped following that, uh, those developments a long time ago. Because some mods just simply work on Enhanced Editions, even if you don't have like a port I guess, when no one really worked on them since they were released back in the day. Uh, some work with uh, certain workarounds, like for example the a big picture version of Ascension was something that I used for a long time, uh, for Baldur's Gate 2 Throne of Ball. And some mods just don't, I guess, and they weren't ported, and that's it. But those are like very minor ones, very, very few. And then when it comes to the specifics of what are, what the nice things are, uh, when it comes to Enhanced Edition, I guess, you know, uh, you don't need to have a quite a big, as big of an install, I guess, in Enhanced Edition, because you get that widescreen uh, aspect ratio, you know, nice UI in Baldur's Gate 1, which is kind of nice that you get a different UI in Baldur's Gate 1. I mean, I love the Baldur's Gate 2 UI as well, but I like to keep the games separate, and it's just scaled better, and, you know, most of these things, like I said, it's it's not a big deal, it's just, those are minor tweaks, but you know, just have to note them, I guess. Of course, you know, it's 
better like optimized I guess for modern systems the the loading times are better and there are some of those bug fixes you actually wouldn't think how many bug fixes and related to like different things um, the enhanced edition did uh, for example they you know fixed sunfire and and cloud kill casts from a wand would also bypass magic resistance for example they actually th fixed the thief skills because in the classics if you buffed up your thief skills over 255 they would actually loop back over to zero so if you had 260 and something that essentially meant that you had five uh, effective skill in that um, in that thief category uh, and, and, and the enhanced edition is kind of weird like I tested that out and provided some results in, in one of the beamdog threads uh, but uh, it basically just only allows you to buff up only so high to like 280 and then after that when you drink potions of mind focusing to buff up your dexterity you can go even higher to like 310 and it seemed like all the skills worked perfectly at that amount so you know that's just another minor thing that they've uh, fixed they also fixed some areas like uh, you know if you kill fire bead elven hair for example in candle keep I think everyone goes hostile so they fixed that in the classics you know no one would care <laughs> Uh, but anyway, the more importantly, the features that I like about Enhanced Editions are the quick loot thing. And I still loot a lot of opponents the classic way. Uh, but it's it's really useful in those situations where you just kill the group of common monsters, like a bunch of Zvarts or Nulls or something, and you just want to quickly pick up the gold piles they, they left on the ground. It's actually really useful in, in uh, Icewind Dale Enhanced Edition, which I'm going to do a playthrough of in the future. Because in, in that game, of course, you battle hordes of basic enemies. Uh, so that's pretty nice. The tab highlight works um, a little different in, in the Enhanced Editions in the fact that, well, tab is your default button to highlight interactable objects and also names of the NPCs and the health status of, uh, like, whatever you would highlight with your cursor in the classics. But in the Enhanced Edition, you actually see the names of every NPC and their health status, whether they are uninjured or, you know, near death or whatever uh, like all of the characters on screen so we don't have to hover your mouse cursor over each one of them individually to check like w which one of the few nulls is like badly injured or something so again it's those are very small things but kinda nice for for convenience then one thing that I really really liked uh, that was uh, well I still like it but that was uh, exclusive to the enhanced edition but isn't anymore because you can mod it now uh, into the classics was the changed graphic of the spell immunity and spell trap spells and yes say spell one more time <laughs> um, but anyway in the classics basically how they look is that uh, the caster is inside of a big shining globe and you can't really see who's in there because the graphic is so intense and aside from the aesthetic annoyance I guess that it provides uh, even gameplay wise it, it can have some consequences because you can't really effectively backstab a character like that because you don't know um, which way they're facing. So again, a small thing that now can be modded, actually. Uh, one downside of uh, the Enhanced Editions, actually, is how they nerfed stealth. Uh, <laughs> basically, that requires an explanation. I think in patch like 1.2 or 1.3, they wanted to nerf the Shadow Dancer kit that they've introduced uh, that can hide in plain sight. And they just really messed up. I, I think they the way they nerfed it is kind of silly uh, because normally in the classics uh, when you hide in shadows and go into stealth if you exit stealth by your own decision by some activity like backstabbing or interacting with a an object or something or just clicking it off uh, you don't get a cooldown on it you can immediately re-stealth if you do that if there's of course no one in your no opponent in your line of sight and you would only get that cooldown, that six second long cooldown, that's, you know, about the length of a round, only if you failed to hide in shadows. Whether it was because your skill was not enough and you didn't make the check for successful hiding in shadows, or if there was some enemy in your line of sight, you know, only then you would have that cooldown that you can't just immediately re-attempt uh, to hide in shadows. But in Enhanced Editions, you actually get that cooldown every time and there are some workarounds to that but you know it's just like not worth it and it's not a big deal at all but just saying that you can't really uh, chain stab as effectively as you can in the classics just you know stab run out re-stealth stab again run out and so on 
All right, so now let's talk about the version because that is hugely important. And that's why I kind of wanted to say what I, why also the enhanced editions get a pass because it's really related to this version. I think 1.3 is the peak of the enhanced editions quality because it basically, you know, still retains the, the whole classic spirit and feel of the classics while providing some of these cool convenience tweaks, some like minor additions here and there. And it's basically, you know, like a very similar experience with a couple of, you know, new things added in to maybe smooth out the experience a little bit. Um, now, the disaster of a patch, that was 2.0. <laughs> Like, I just don't even want to talk about that, because I don't want to be too negative. But that patch changed that feel a lot, and the, the features that it introduced, I, I liked pretty much every, once, uh, every one of them. It also broke mods, like introduced uh, tons of bugs. Like, I've reported so many bugs. Oh, it's just like, let's not even talk about it. But anyway, that's also related to Siege of Dragonspear. Basically, once they released Siege of Dragonspear, they also forced this patch 2.0, um, even onto users that didn't buy it, in both Baldur's Gate 1 and Baldur's Gate 2. So, um, uh, well, at least on Steam, that I have the games on, um, and a lot of people have this misconception that, you know, if you turn off automatic updates on Steam, that you don't have to update and you can, uh, you know, play an outdated version of the game, but you can't. If you want to play the game, you still have to update. And turning off automatic updates means that the games won't just, like, update in the background while you're doing something else. Uh, just, you know, update by themselves when the update is available. Uh, so anyway, you. but fortunately, there is, of course, as you can see, the rollback to 1.3 that, <laughs> of course, didn't work for a few days after they released that 2.0 patch, which really made me spiral into despair, but <laughs> fortunately, thank God, it was fixed. And now we can play 1.3, and basically how you can do that on Steam, uh, I'm not sure about the GOG version or the, like, Beamdog Launcher version, but on Steam, and that's a general piece of advice, because... Uh, many other developers do it like that, they uh, allow access to a different version of the game through that. Uh, and uh, you go into the betas tab, so you have to go into your library, right click on the game and go into properties, and then access the betas tab and kind of quote unquote sign in to the quote unquote, uh, you know, beta version of uh, the game. And here, of course, you sign up for the 1.3 version and it's fully functional. So thank God for that. All right, now let's talk about the mods, and this is going to take a while. Jesus, this video is really going to take like two hours <laughs> or something. But anyway, the, the mods. Now, my general philosophy when it comes to the mods in this playthrough is that I wanted to include a few very essential mods that I basically can't imagine playing without, and they are just extremely good. But otherwise, keep it pretty vanilla. I, I didn't want to, um, you know, use a lot of mods that add new items or new adventures or change mechanics, kind of. Even if they're good, like rogue rebalancing or spell revisions and something like that. And I'm saying kind of here because, you know, SCS changes some spells a little bit. And um, I think the BG1 NPC project, uh, like, uh, adds a little bit of... Uh, like quest items, but generally, you know, all of that is left untouched. And I basically just said the names of the two most important mods. Um, and yeah, I wanted to keep it pretty vanilla, although normally I do a much bigger install and maybe I will do like a bigger install, kind of much more heavily modded playthrough of Baldur's Gate someday. But for now, I wanted to, to do this so that anyone watching you know, it doesn't feel too unfamiliar, I guess, with what they're looking at. And uh, there's something else I think I wanted to say about mods. Oh yeah, the unfinished business mods. Uh, I kind of debated whether I should install them. I decided not to, because uh, although a lot of people really like those mods, I really don't like some of the uh, components that they offer. And uh, I normally go for that kind of thing, like all the restoration type things that didn't make it uh, to the final release. 
uh, of the game due to some time constraints or whatever. I, I usually like these restorations, but in most cases when it comes to Baldur's Gate, they are so minor that I don't really understand why would you even bother installing the mod for such minor things. And some components that aren't as minor, I just kind of don't like them too much. Especially like in Baldur's Gate 2, um, like you have this component where it's explained what Kala was promised and stuff like that. And I just don't feel that everything needs to be explained like that. And some of these components are pretty bad in my opinion. So anyway, long story short, I didn't include the unfinished business type mods in this playthrough. The ones that I did include are BG1 NPC Project, like I said, for... Um, oh, th those are the Baldur's Gate 1 mods. I'm going to make an introductory video like this for Baldur's Gate separately, where I'm going to talk about the Baldur's Gate 2 mods. But for Baldur's Gate 1, I installed BG1 NPC Project, SCS, and a few components of BG2 tweaks that I'm going to list. Uh, so first off, BG1 NPC Project, that's kind of like a role-playing mod, I guess. Um, but, you know, aside from the banters and interjections and reactions, it's really more than that. It's essential, in my opinion, and I would highly recommend it even if you don't heavily engage in roleplay and stuff like that. Maybe if you don't even care about banters and stuff like that too much. It still offers a lot. And basically, when it comes to the banter quality, it essentially brings over to Baldur's Gate 1 that uh, banter and interjection quality known from Baldur's Gate 2 where uh, different recruitable NPCs that you have in your party can talk with themselves, have conversations with you and they can react to different situations where you have a conversation with something, someone else they can interject um, so that's cool but what is really cool about this mod actually is that uh, they had a lot of cool ideas when it came to like filling some of the gaps where, of course, in Baldur's Gate 1, characters would remain silent when some important events for them were going on. And here they actually took some really cool opportunities and had some nice ideas, especially when it comes to Imoen as well. It's just so cool when it comes to certain situations that they just fill in these gaps really nicely and they basically take a lot of opportunities to let those Baldur's Gate 1 NPC feel, NPCs feel uh, a little bit more alive, I guess. And one important uh, thing about this mod also is its high quality. Like, when it comes to uh, the writing content, content, I'm normally very, very picky, and there's a lot of NPC mods or adventure mods that I just kind of can't get through because I get annoyed by how they're written. Like, if you have two punctuation marks, one after another, like the same two punctuation marks, that's wrong! <laughs> and things like that. Really dorky about it, I guess. But this mod is actually of very high quality when it comes to its writing. Well, both when it comes to its substance and form, I guess. Substance is, uh, you know, the topics of the conversations are interesting, they're funny, the characters known from Baldur's Gate 2 are kept very well in character, to the point that you would, wouldn't really know that uh, other people actually wrote these Baldur's Gate 1 conversations and not the original developers. And also the form, like how everything's written, it's really good. Um, also, the mod allows to uh, install a component where certain NPCs that would normally uh, become available for recruitment very, very late in the game, they are actually transported to some different locations that are accessible very early in the game. And those are Tiax, Elora, Quail, and Eldoth. And normally they would be available, like I said, much later in the game. And uh, this mod, and SCS does that as well, actually. It uh, moves those NPCs into places that really make sense for them, and um, just allows you to have them for the whole playthrough. And there are some NPCs that still are only available very late in the game, but that's because there is no other way about it. Like, for example, Yeslik, you know, he's a prisoner. Like, they can't just uh, teleport him somewhere else and, and change his whole identity, basically related to that imprisonment and stuff like that. And uh, also, it's uh, the, the mod allows you for a new uh, leave group dialogue uh, along the lines of Baldur's Gate 2, where you can just tell them to stay where they are or to go to a certain location that's uh, 
characteristic to them. Mostly they're going to go back to Friendly Armin, sort of like they go back to Copper Coronet in Baldur's Gate 2. But there are certain NPCs that are going to uh, return to a different location, and of course they're going to inform you what that location is. Uh, also, the, the mod provides romances, which I'm not going to engage in, but there are three romances for females and three romances for male characters. And then uh, one thing that I have to say that it's kind of like an unfortunate um, consequence of this mod that where no one's to blame, really, is that some, uh, some characters, if you install this mod, you know, might not align in with your imagination of that character, your vision. And um, they're usually all of the NPCs that are only known from Baldur's Gate 1, I mean here, where, you know, there's not that much material to go by when it comes to, you know, getting to know them and, like, building up uh, from that fundament. You know, ba because basically uh, all you go, all you have to go by is their initial conversation when you recruit them, their voice lines, and um, their biography note, pretty much. So you can really expand that character any way you want, and of course it's just a natural, unfortunate consequence that not all of those characters are going to match up with your vision or your imagining of that character. And for me it's kind of unfortunate because one of my favorite characters from the unmodded game is Kiven, or Kaivan, and um, you know, I just imagined him completely differently. I don't really like how they wrote him in this mod, but you know, it's, it's not a big deal. And basically all of the other BG1 only NPCs, I think they're written very well. They're made interesting. And it's just a really, really great mod that I can't imagine playing without. And now, the big one. <laughs> SCS, Sword Coast Stratagems. That's a, a mod that's going to be extremely inf influential throughout the whole saga because it's a mod used in both Baldur's Gate 1 and Baldur's Gate 2 and Throne of All. It sets the difficult tone for this playthrough, uh, especially since I'm going to have pretty much the max install of all of its components. One thing that uh, I would like to say now is that it's a very, very customizable mod, so even if you don't like all of its features, you can just pick and choose and install just what you like. And more than that, a lot of its components come in a couple of versions, so you can just install a certain version of a certain component. So there's a lot of uh, customization options when it comes to SCS, and it's not even recommended that you do like a full install for your first encounter with SCS, I guess, but more on that a little bit later. So what SCS does, what I would categorize, or break it down into three categories, I'm not sure if that's how the uh, developers, the creators of this mod, uh, break it down, but it's basically for me, th th there are three categories of what it does. Uh, the first one are the AI improvements, and that's the, the main thing that the mod does. second one are kind of like fixes of different attributes, proficiencies, and the third one are the tactical challenges. Those are really cool. So to talk about uh, each one of them in, in more detail, of course the uh, improved intelligence of the opponents is basically like 95% of what the mod does, and that's going to provide us with the most uh, difficulty increase, and it might not sound like much, but really that matters uh, a lot. And uh, the the scripts for different opponents that are written are actually really high quality, uh, some pretty well gameplay from these characters that you can actually learn from uh, when you first play with SCS installed. You can actually learn a lot when it comes to mages, especially in how they set up their spells and spell sequencers, contingencies, and stuff like that. So anyway, this component. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, the opponents that are a little bit more basic, so the fighter-oriented uh, opponents. You can still see the improvements when it comes to them, especially the archers, in just how they target, how they choose their targets. Because, you know, archers have a long range, they have kind of a nice choice of who they um, choose to attack. And they're basically going to focus on uh, trying to interrupt your casters, that's a really big one. And also it seems like they uh, want to target uh, or prioritize more wounded targets than full health ones, which also makes sense that they want to finish off people that are already wounded instead of like spreading the damage evenly between everyone. And also when it comes to this uh, component, let's talk about the potions that they receive. Uh, SCS opponents actually receive a lot of potions, and then they depend on the class of the opponent and their 
kind of the quality of the opponent, so to speak. Like, you know, a common soldier is not going to have the same quality of potions as like some higher up, uh, some kind of a leader and whatnot. And uh, also the class, you know, of course, uh, fighters are going to have uh, like potions of strength, which actually really boost their performance. Um, or potions of invulnerability, potions of uh, heroism, that kind of stuff. Whereas thieves are mostly going to have invisibility potions, which they're going to use to backstab you more. And mages also sometimes get invisibility potions just to get um, out of a dangerous situation, usually. So of course they, uh, you know, drink these potions, they uh, target differently. But let's talk about the, the main focus. On the of the AI improvements, which are the casters, and those are mostly mages, but um, or you know arcane casters, mages and sorcerers, but also divine casters, clerics and druids. There's a lot of improvements there. And uh, first off, the selection of spells that they have memorized, like that, that's the fundamental thing. Uh, they they have just better spells memorized, and and basically just a set of spells that uh, you know work well together or that fit the specialization of the mage and um, th that's basically a thing that is going to be kind of randomized each fresh install of SCS that you do and I would really recommend to do a fresh installation of SCS every playthrough um, and like all the mods really that's really a recommended way to go if you finish a playthrough you should just do a clean uninstall and then just install the mods only for that upcoming playthrough that you want to use and basically every fresh install of SCS is going to kind of randomize somewhat the selection of spells that different uh, casters are going to get so you don't really know what to expect like in 100% although some of the mages are of a certain specialty always uh, and they're going to have a set of spells that reflects that and um, so yeah they're not going to have like infravision memorized <laughs> for example just effective spells and also how their spell sequencers are set up and their contingencies, like I said, it's just very effective and they're going to make the most use out of that. Because that's that's the second thing, how they use these spells is much more effective. Like you're not going to have situations where they keep casting spell that's that you're clearly immune to. Or they're going to, of course, prioritize first dispelling your protections and then using some spells that would affect you. Or um, they're going to also reapply their own protections, you know, to, to stay alive. Also, their behavior in between casting spells is influenced. Uh, like, for example, mages are often pre-buffed with um, minute meteors, so they're going to throw those in between spells to try to interrupt your casters, or they're going to just, like, move around uh, to, to get away from your fighters or whatever. So, th there's just a lot that goes into it. And like I said, you can actually... Those are very effective, and you can actually learn a lot the first time or two that you play with SCS. And then uh, there's also another component that kind of, that kind of uh, lands in this category, which are the, the pre-buffs that I've mentioned. And this is a little controversial one. Uh, it's not liked by everyone, but I do a full install here because I think it's, it's better for the gameplay that way. Anyway, what I'm talking about is that um, it's meant to simulate the same uh, pre-buff capabilities that you have as a player. Like, if you know a fight is coming, you can just buff up and then enter the the fight with all of those buffs already applied and normally opponents don't have that option so this component is meant to simulate that so how it works out is that when the fight starts they will basically receive a bunch of instant buffs it's kind of like as if a contingency uh, procced I guess or went off and uh, you can clearly see what buffs they have and you you can you know uh, develop your strategy on, on how to counter those. And um, uh, th there's a couple of versions of this component. It's kind of like a realistic version where uh, the opponents only are going to have the pre-buffs if they could like expect to fight you when they ambush you, for example, but not when you know a fight breaks out uh, unexpectedly as a result of a conversation or something when they're not hostile and so on. I, like I said, I, I have pre-buffs always because I find that the gameplay is better that way. Because, you know, in unmodded Baldur's, Guy, Baldur's Gate 1 mages are just, you know, they just die in two hits before they even manage to <laughs> apply mirror image or something. And even if they do, they just kind of stand there and take a beating. <laughs> so here, of course, once they have these pre-buffs, they 
actually have a lot more options open to them and they can actually do stuff and uh, they can they are actually like mini bosses in the game uh, because like I said the scripts are pretty good for them and how they behave and um, also when it comes to the pre-buffs in Baldur's Gate 1 there's no breach uh, you can dispel mirror images but when it comes to stone skin for example you just have to cut through it the hard way so <laughs> it also uh, you know, influences your approach a little bit. Uh, that's going to be different in Baldur's Gate 1 uh, in comparison to Baldur's Gate 2. But anyway, the, the second category are some of the fixes, I guess, uh, because um, sometimes different creatures in the game wouldn't have the proper amount of health or the proper saving throws or uh, actually the correct proficiencies. There are times where, you know, like a um, like a fighter would wield a sword, but wouldn't have any proficiency points put into swords, but rather into maces or something. So of course, SCS corrects all that, and actually through a couple of different components, it actually just straight up buffs different types of creatures, and uh, sometimes adds a level or two to certain opponents to make them immune to sleep, or to just you know increase their stats a little bit. So through the combination of AI, the potions that they get, and the stat improvements, like, everything is generally just tougher all across the board. And then, uh, oh, also, this this category kind of, SCS adds kits to a lot of the opponents. And kits are basically kind of like subclasses of uh, the certain, like, classic classes like a fighter or a thief or a cleric or a mage. There are certain kits. So, for example, a berserker is a kit of a fighter. So, a lot of opponents actually get kits. And kits have different advantages and disadvantages compared to the base class. And sometimes they give them new abilities and stuff like that. So well, in a lot of cases, they are just, you know, in a lot of situations, I guess kits are kind of like a straight up upgrade. So that also makes the game tougher. And, you know, it basically gives the opponents uh, your um, options because for if you play on the Baldur's Gate 2 engine through the enhanced editions or other means, of course, you can. Uh, pick a kit for your characters made by your yourself uh, But anyway the third category are the tactical challenges and this might be my favorite because those are basically modifications to encounters that are not limited to just uh, Improving their AI here the creators just basically give themselves free reign and all the options to just make different encounters tougher or more interesting and those are just great uh, you know, here they can give creatures like new abilities or add different op opponents in the fight and just change it in uh, various ways. And a great example of that is, for example, wow, nice, nice talking there. But a great example of that is um, the ending of the Allcasters uh, ruins. That's basically a dungeon in the game, and at the end of which you face off against a vampiric wolf normally. And of course, depending on the stage of the game you're at, a Vampiric Wolf can be a pretty tough opponent, I guess, because it's immune to normal weapons and it can paralyze on hit and stuff. But other than that, it's just a generic Vampiric Wolf, and there's nothing special about it. But SCS actually places or replaces that Vampiric Wolf with a unique Wolf of Allcaster that actually is like much tougher, uh, tougher. It has its own abilities, it can summon adds. It's a cool fight, and of course we're going to visit that place and I'm going to point out pretty much like all of the um, changes with these uh, tactical encou encounters these tactical challenges or whatever also a, a great one my favorite I think is the bandit camp encounter that one is so good and I will of course elaborate on that once we get to it but that one is just incredible it's so cool so much better and so much tougher also to beat so uh, anyway, when it comes to SCS, I'm not one of these people who think this is a perfect mod without flaws, but th there are some, like uh, some people can consider the tunnel vision kind of that uh, SCS fixes the stats. That's kind of, you know, sometimes opponents uh, have lowered stats for a reason, like Lavok in Baldur's Gate 2, for example. But you know, if you want to be thorough uh, in your fixes, then I guess you have to do all of them. But in general, when it comes to that, the downsides are so, so heavily outweighed by the upsides that it's pretty much like not even worth talking about, almost. But let, let's just point out a few when it comes to Baldur's Gate 1, some consequences that might be viewed as kind of unfortunate. 
Uh, one of them is that you're kind of incentivized to rush to level 5 just to become immune to sleep. Sleep is a very powerful, debilitating spell, but you get immune to it once you get level 5 and higher. And uh, it's a spell that can turn the tide of the battle completely, whether it's in your favor or in the favor of opponents. So you are really incentivized to get to level 5 because pretty much every mage is going to spam sleep and just ruin your day with it. And uh, of course when you are at level 5 and up they will never cast it again. And that's kind of a downside in SCS sometimes that opponents are kind of a little bit more too... Uh, a little bit too psychic I guess in what they know. Sometimes they just know <laughs> some things that you are immune to. And they won't even try to cast one spell, see that you're immune, and then go with a different plan. They just know already. Um, another kind of downside is the... Well, what I, I think that you should have to go with... Um, that you should go in Baldur's Gate 1 SCS with your kind of Baldur's Gate 2 approach to spells. And what I mean by that is that you should pretty much almost only pick spells that either do something even if they were saved against, so the opponent made a successful saving throw against them and they still do something, or you should pick spells that actually come with some penalties to saving throws, like the level 2 um, cleric spell silence, like 15 foot radius or whatever it is, uh, that comes with a minus 5 saving throw penalty. Uh, that's, that's effective, because generally, you know, saving throws of opponents in SCS are so high that uh, going for spells that don't don't do anything when they were saved against it's kind of really a waste of a memori memorization spot in most cases and that's kind of unfortunate in in the case of some spells that I, I liked and before I started playing with SCS I kind of liked Baldur's Gate 1 in the fact that you could actually get to play around with spells that by the time Baldur's Gate 2 rolls over uh, rolls around <laughs> I, should, I should say they are not effective anymore. So something like Blindness, for example, a level 1 spell Blindness, uh, pretty much every opponent worth blinding in SCS is going to save against it like 9 out of 10 times. So, or maybe I'm just unlucky. But that's it. But uh, of course, you know, there are also upsides, like you have to care about the defenses of your mages, about their personal defenses, because like I said, uh, how uh, likely the opponents are to go for your casters if they're, they're not protected to interrupt their spells and stuff. You really have to make sure they're protected. Because in the unmodded game you can just kind of leave them in, their ba in the back of your group and they're generally safe. And you can kind of do that to a certain extent to, in SCS too, but you know, it's, it's, it's a completely different scenario most, in the, uh, most of the time. And we really have to care about uh, the protections of your, uh, of your characters. And in general, the, the game just changes so much that if you've never played with SCS, it's going to pretty much be a, like a, a completely new game for you. You know, like when all combat is just so much different, so much tougher, and the opponents are so much better when it comes to their behavior and they make more sense. It's going to be a completely new challenge. And um, also what SCS does actually is it allows to separate the pairs of NPCs. There's a few ones a uh, few pairs of NPCs in Baldur's Gate 1 that cannot be separated. Well, unless you use a few tricks, I'm going to elaborate on them uh, once we get to the playthrough. Uh, but generally, you know, there, there's, for example, the married couple, Jahira and Khalid, and you can't just remove one or recruit one without recruiting the other under normal circumstances. And there are tricks, like I said, to, to do that very painlessly, but I just installed that component um, just to make it, you know, even less of a hassle. Also, uh, SCS gives you the, op the opportunity to remove Boo uh, from Minsk's quick slots and actually put him into his backpack, sort of like a familiar, which I also installed. Like, like I said, I pretty much did a full install with just... I basically just didn't install um, like two components, pretty much. One of, the, one of which um, replaces the magical plus one enchanted weapons with like a, a masterwork non-magical versions. I don't feel like it changes the game balance at all. And uh, it just basically makes it so that... Well, th there's also a component that they don't break as a result of the Iron Crisis, but I just kind of fail to see the point. I would like to show you the... you know, some plus one weapons and stuff where you find them normally without any changes. Whoops. Just playing around with some stuff as we're talking. 
Uh, well, anyway, so I didn't in uh, install that, and I also didn't install the component that reduces your reputation gains as you do certain quests and certain like activities, just because I wanted to just show you where to get the different reputation uh, increases. And there's actually a couple of areas where you can just get a very quick plus two or plus three reputation, even in one area. So just, you know, in order to be kind of informative and show what the game has to offer, I wanted to not change these mechanics at all. And yeah, that's pretty much it, I think, when it comes to SCS. It's an, it's an incredible mod, I can't imagine playing without it. And then the third mod, like I said, was the, the mod called BG2 Tweaks. And I just installed a few very, very minor tweaks, like, for example, I improved the booze squeak. <laughs> it, it actually has, like, a different animal sound now, like a more appropriate one. It's not just a person saying, squeak, sped up. <laughs> then uh, the max HP that I talked about. I also removed the voiceover for the classic line, you must gather your party before venturing forth. Uh, it's going to function like in Icewind Dale, where you get the message in, in the chat box, but not the voiceover. Then I installed the happy patch with the uh, NPCs don't, find, don't fight component. It's basically just to not have to artificially manipulate my reputation to keep some of the evil NPCs in my party once I reach 19 or 20 reputation. Where it just, you know, the, the whole reputation system, maybe I'm going to talk about that once we get into the gameplay at some point. Uh, it's kind of a stiff in its implementation, but I, I think when Baldur's Gate came out, it was actually kind of innovative and revolutionary, maybe even. And I get the idea that, you know, you, you don't want to have, or good aligned characters don't want to be in a party that engages in evil deeds and... Uh, you know, evil characters don't want to be in a party that, you know, just does good stuff without... Um, or charitable stuff, I guess. But, you know, it's kind of stiff in its implementation, and I just like mixing and matching different aligned NPCs. Some of my favorite NPCs are evil, like Edwin, for example. So, um, yeah. So I installed that. Also, the TOB-style NPCs, which is basically, you know, instead of getting, like, a level 5 version of a character once you recruit them later on in the game uh, you actually get a level 1 version but with the experience so that you can level them up personally um, and that basically what that means is that you can for example assign their thieving skills if you're recruiting a thief uh, th their skills are not going to be spread evenly all over but uh, actually you can choose how they increase their their thieving skills and I also changed, uh, like, Jahira's uh, alignment to neutral good, because she's not neutral. Like, she talks about the balance sometimes, but she's basically a neutral good character. And I gave her her uh, Baldur's Gate 2 stats, which is something that I never do, because I like to keep them separate. But I figured, in this playthrough, Jahira is going to be such a dead weight, <laughs> pretty much. Because I kind of tried to figure out... Uh, how I could uh, just remove her from the party and, uh, and basically go without her except certain uh, story relevant parts but she basically has like some relevant conversations through the uh, BG1 NPC project pretty much everywhere you know she's pretty relevant in Nashkel, she's relevant in very relevant in Cloakwood you pretty much have to have her and then relevant later on and she's also, you know, together with Khalid and Imowen, I guess, you're only link to Gorion. So I kind of felt like she's important enough to keep her for the whole playthrough, but mechanically, not only is she a low-level um, character, you know, in Baldur's Gate 1, but low-level druids. Like, she's not even a pure-class druid, which have the advantage in Baldur's Gate 1 that they can actually get access to level 5 spells because of... Um, the druid leveling curve, they can actually get level 10 in Baldur's Gate 1 and get access to level 5 spells, but Jahira is a multi-class, so she can't get to that. And basically, even if she could, the bread and butter uh, levels of spells in Baldur's Gate 1 are levels 1, 2, and 3, and where the Baldur's Gate druid spell selection for those levels is just dreadful. It's not your Icewind Dale druid, that's really cool and fun, <laughs> and 
the, those levels, especially 1 and 2, and level 3 at least in Baldur's Gate 1, since it's such an outdoors-based game, you can at least use a lot of coal lightning at level 3, but level 1 and 2 are just absolutely dreadful <laughs> when it comes to her spell selection. So, yeah, she's kind of a dead weight, but I really like her in Baldur's Gate 2 mechanically, and generally when it comes to her personality, well, this, this is probably something that I should talk about once we get to recruit her. So yeah, those are all of the different tweaks. Whew! Now we have the mod section finished, and now we can actually get to click some more, because let's go through the character uh, creation process. Let's create a character, and just go through some of the elements in here, so I can just talk about the different stats and uh, things related to that. So when it comes to the genders, it doesn't matter. Let's have this guy, always liked that portrait, and it's not used by any NPC in the game. Uh, now, the races. Uh, humans are your general... Uh, it's kind of like in a lot of fantasy or science fiction games where humans are... They don't have any advantages or disadvantages in terms of stats. Like, you can see that they have... This is basically the basic thief. Um, you know, opening skills. They don't get any bonuses. Um, and when it comes to their attributes or like special abilities, they don't have one, uh, but well, they can dual class, and that's something that I'm going to discuss uh, in a second. Uh, they are the only race that can dual class, and all of the other races can multi class, and those are very different things. And you can argue, and I would say that having the ability to dual class is, makes humans the, the most powerful race, because dual class is just broken. But it's just so cool, and I'm addicted to it, pretty much. But anyway, like, uh, you can see uh, elves, for example, they have a 90% resistance against charm and sleep, so that's pretty nice. They have plus one thaco with bows and short and long swords, and also get, like, plus one dexterity, but they have the disadvantage of only, um, you know, of the minus one constitution, which means that they can't have as high of a constitution, and I'm going to refer to that once we talk about stats. And also, there's something that I wanted to say about the shorty saves, the so-called shorty saves. The short races, gnomes, halflings, and dwarves, have a bonus to their saving throws based on their constitution. So it starts at like, I think, 12 constitution, and there are certain brackets of it where you can get to plus 5 to their bonuses to the saving throws that are listed here. Uh, when you have 18 or more constitution, you get plus 5 saving throw uh, bonus to these categories. And they're a little bit different between halflings, gnomes, and dwarves. But that is just insanely good. So just something that has to be, um, has to be mentioned. Anyway, let's, let's pick dwarf, for example. And now we get to pick a class. So, as you can see, different races have different classes to choose from, and as you can see here when, it, when we click Fighter, those are the kits. Berserker, Wizard, Slayer, Kensai, Dwarven Defender. And uh, you can see the, the basic outline of the Fighter, and then a, a Berserker, for example, it has the advantage of having Berserker Rage, um, but they can't specialize in ranged weapons, which generally, you know, is, is not a big deal at all, so Berserker it's just kind of like a straight upgrade to the fighter in a lot of situations. Of course, if you don't want to make an archer, I guess. And so, uh, yeah, th those are the kits. And the multi-classes, as you can see, basically allow you to be two classes or three classes uh, at the same time. And what that means is that you can progress in, in both classes or, or all three classes um, at the same time and basically have uh, the different attributes of these two or three different classes in one person, but all of the experience gets split into two or three, so you level up m slower. And in Baldur's Gate 1, actually, multi-classes are extremely strong, because compared to a pure class, you end up just usually one level, level lower, so it's just really... Th those are really strong. In Baldur's Gate 2, it gets a little bit more balanced, but when it comes to some classes, not really. <laughs> Uh, well, again, like, when it comes to talking about balance, there's pretty much n no such thing. And, uh, you... I usually go for, like, you know, the feel of the class, the flavor, and certain mechanics. The one thing that multi-classes can't have when... even when being a fighter is that they can't get a Grand Mastery. They can only specialize. So they can only have two proficiency points in uh, any given weapon. 
and dual classing that humans can do, it basically is first going up in, a, in one class, in your pure class or in your single class that you've chosen, and then at certain point leaving that class and starting over, pretty much starting leveling from level one in a new class. And then when you outlevel your first class with your second class, then you regain at least some of the abilities of your first class. And that can create very, very powerful combos because, for example, the most common thing is to, to go like the first nine levels in Fighter to get, uh, you know, access to Grand Mastery and uh, take advantage of, of the hit points of a Fighter and then just dual class into a Mage or a Thief and then just keep leveling as the Mage or a Thief for the rest of the game where those classes, especially Mage, you know, gets way more benefits at higher levels uh, than a fighter does. Uh, well, generally. There are different types of combos, and it's just a super cool mechanic. So anyway, let, let's let's uh, be a fighter, for example. And uh, then you choose your alignment. That's a purely role-playing thing. Um, I will, like, highlight some of those alignments if you want to pause the game and, and read about them. Um, like, my favorite is, is Chaotic Good, that's my pretty much my real-life alignment. And there's way more sources on the internet trying to um, talk about the different alignments. Uh, you basically have one axis when it comes to good, neutral, or evil, and then the other one when it comes to lawful, neutral, or chaotic. And uh, that's purely a role-playing thing, it doesn't really matter in terms, in terms of game mechanics, but some classes have certain requirements. Like, for example, if you're a thief, you cannot be lawful good. Or if you are a Kensai, you cannot be chaotic. Or if you are a monk, you have to be lawful. It, like, either lawful good, lawful neutral, or lawful evil. So there are certain requirements when it comes to the classes. But even if you choose lawful good, and you're not a paladin, I guess, that can fall, or a ranger, when you get um, low enough reputation, you can pretty much, like, do anything anyway. And it only changes in Baldur's Gate 2 as a result of some of your actions, but you know, it's it's not something that you might be familiar with from like Planescape Torment or something. So let's just say Chaotic Good for example. Now we have our abilities. You can uh, re-roll the abilities and you can... Uh, Enhanced Edition actually adds this total roll so we don't have to add up manually to see how high of a total roll you've gotten. And now let's talk about the different attributes and this is going to be uh, kind of a big portion of this video uh, again, I think. Oh, before we get to talk about the, the particular attributes, let's just talk a little bit uh, about the attributes in general, because there's a few things that I wanted to say. Uh, the general range of stats in the game is from 1 to 25, and um, the range for all of the kind of humanoid races that you can choose to play as is from 3 to 18. So basically to highlight the difference, you know, uh, humans, for example, can only go up to 18 strength, which is kind of like super strong in human terms. But, you know, if you were to be a fire giant, <laughs> for example, you would have 22 strength. Or if you were, I think dragons have 25, and, you know, different types of giants have a different type, um, different uh, strength amount. Um, and, yeah, that's, that's basically, you know, unattainable for, like, humanoid races, you know, it's like superhuman strength. But, of course, uh, the limit of 25 is there to... that's basically the max you can buff up to, because you can, th through temporary or permanent buffs, you can get higher than the usual 3 to 18 range, um, but you cannot go higher than 25. Then uh, another thing is that if you go in any attribute, if any of your attributes reaches zero uh, because it got drained or something happened, uh, you die, actually. <laughs> so that, that's the consequence of reaching zero, I guess. Now, uh, it has to also be said that when it comes to the attributes in the game, um, there is a very irregular progression both when it comes to going higher than average, which, which would be around like 10 or 9, uh, then going higher grants you bonuses, and going lower than that, um, well, we can go below 9 strength because we're a fighter, but let's go into dexterity, for example, we can go down to 3, or uh, actually as a dwarf we can go up to, um, or down to 2. Uh, 
So generally when you have a low amount, it gives you some kind of penalty in what the stat governs, I guess, or what it influences. And when you go high, uh, it can it gives you bonuses, but that's an irregular progression. It's not like the third edition where like every two points above uh, 10, you would get a plus one to what that uh, skill, inf uh, what that attribute influences. So at 14, you would be at plus two, for example. It's not like that in, in this edition. And just to uh, give you an idea, a Dwarf can have one Charisma. And then as you can see, when it comes to Constitution, Dwarves have a bonus of plus one, so they can go up to 19 Constitution, but they have a disadvantage of minus one to Dexterity, so they can only go up to 17 in Dexterity. Uh, also, it has to be said that in Baldur's Gate 1, there's a magical tome for every uh, attribute that can increase it permanently by one, and uh, that's that's available for every attribute. There's one tome, with the exception of Wisdom, for which there are three tomes, actually. So uh, some decisions when it comes to creating characters in Baldur's Gate 1, you know, you can obviously base on the knowledge that you, were, you are going to get a plus one increase at some point. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, when you play the saga and you find the tome and use it on your character. Now also, kind of a minor thing, but it has to be mentioned that um, certain attributes, uh, they, they can also, very rarely, it's a very rare thing, but they can also, pretty much every attribute almost, um, or maybe everyone, uh, one of those can uh, actually influence some conversation Sometimes there's, it's very rare, and it's mostly in Baldur's Gate 2, uh, certain other attributes can influence what dialogue options you get, or how effective that dialogue option is. And it mostly relates to wisdom. Uh, there's an, a conversation in Baldur's Gate 2 uh, with a beholder, for example, and you can kind of out-reason him uh, if you have high enough wisdom. Uh, I think it's 16. And uh, th there's also one conversation when if you're strong enough you can successfully intimidate a guy or if you have high enough dexterity you can just uh, grab uh, kind of skillfully some documents when he's not looking and that's done through a conversation option. But generally, you know, charisma is what influences the, uh, the conversations. But there are certain rare opportunities where other attributes can influence some conversation options as well. Uh, also, some attributes are needed just to equip or use certain items, and it usually refers to strength and intelligence. Uh, for example, you know, to be able to wield a, uh, to equip a large shield, you need at least 12 strength, for example. And uh, intelligence it usually refers to scrolls and uh, wands, and we're going to talk more when we talk about intelligence, uh, more about that. And then, uh, you know, there are the certain minimums and maximums for different classes that I've already showcased. So, whatever, let's like... Oh, one more thing, since we're going to be talking about strength. Now let's talk about... Let's talk about uh, the particular attributes. So strength, in terms of game mechanics, like wh what it kind of is, you can read here, uh, but in terms of uh, game mechanics, it influences a couple of things. Um, it influences your carrying capacity, that's, I guess, for everyone. Um, and it's, again, not regular uh, progression, and it's not like every point um, changes your carrying capacity. For example, you have the exact same carrying capacity at 10 and 11 strength, and it's, again, the same for 12 and 13. But anyway, um, how inventory works and how carrying things work uh, in Baldur's Gate is that, of course, you have your inventory slots, and then a lot of items also have a certain weight. Uh, that can slow you down if you go over the carrying capacity that you are allowed on, uh, based on your strength. And there's a lot of items that don't weigh anything, like scrolls, for example, but, you know, like, plate armor is going to weigh quite a bit. So, uh, you also have to remember about that when you're equipping a character, and it's not very strong, but can still equip, like, plate armor or something, then if you're fully equipped in heavy armor, then that character is not going to probably have a lot of carrying capacity for carrying um, heavy stuff. But it's usually not a big deal at all when you play with a full party. There's Usually you're going to have some strong guys to just carry some of the heavier stuff and then you can use your weaklings to carry the, the stuff that doesn't weigh anything or some lightweight stuff. Now when it comes to strength, uh, 
the second, and it's probably the, the most important thing, is that it influences your melee effectiveness because it gives you uh, well bonuses or penalties but I will always talk about the bonuses now let, let's but you should always remember that you know if you go super low in strength you're going to have penalties uh, but let's talk about the bonuses it gives you bonuses to your Thaco and your damage what Thaco is by the way it stands for two hit armor class zero and it's basically your chance to hit it's a, a constant relation between the Thaco and the armor class of the opponent an armor class is basically like your avoidance it doesn't mitigate damage but it's uh, the better armor class you have the harder you are to hit so it's kind of like uh, avoidance in a lot of games so for melee it's, it's basically starting from like 16 strength you get some bonuses they are of course irregular and um, yeah uh, you, you get a higher chance to hit in melee and you can deal more damage through strength and now what's this this number after the forward slash here that's exceptional strength and warrior classes which are fighters uh, barbarians, paladins, and rangers. Actually, when once they are at 18 strength, they can also have a second roll from uh, 1 to 100. That's reflected by by this number. If you roll 100, it's uh, depicted or like reflected by uh, two zeros here. That's a perfect hundred. Uh, and basically, this is a bonus for warrior classes once they have 18 strength. And there are certain brackets for that. Uh, when it comes to exceptional strength, um, you know, there's one bracket from 1 to 50, which just gives you, like, one bonus damage, I think. What you should really aim for, like, I would re-roll this, because uh, what you kind of should aim for in Baldur's Gate 1 is to have at least 51 uh, of exceptional strength, and it's not hard to roll because it's, you know, 50-50 chance, essentially. Uh, because that gives you another bonus to your Thaco, which... You know, considering that you're probably going to use the Tome of Strength to bring your strength up to 19, you might think it doesn't really matter too much, but you get a, gain access to that Tome kind of late in the game. So for a lot of the game, depending whether you rush or not for it, and with SCS I wouldn't recommend rushing, um, you know, th this is going to be your strength for a, a large part of the game, so I would recommend going for at least 51, because that gives you that additional Thaco, which at those low levels in Baldur's Gate 1 is actually kind of noticeable. In Baldur's Gate 2, you know, on higher levels, it's not that big of a deal anyway, but, you know, it's, it's kind of nice. And then the other brackets are from 76 to 90, and then from 91 to 99, and then 100 is its own bracket, which gives you yet another Thaco bonus and... Um, it's damage bonus. Um, uh, yeah, strength, as I mentioned, is used for using items, for determining whether you can equip items. So, for example, a large shield requires 12, and a large shield plus 1 uh, requires 14. So it's something that Branwen, for example, cannot um, equip. Branwen is a companion. Um, cannot equip without any, uh, like, buffs or, you know, equipment that would uh, increase her strength. Anyway, the last thing that strength influences is bashing locks. Uh, locks on containers or on doors can be opened either by thieves lockpicking, which we're going to talk about in a second, or um, or you can bash them open if you're strong enough. Uh, so, you know, the stronger you are, the the tougher locks, I guess, you can bash open. Now let's talk about dexterity. Um, dexterity is kind of like a hybrid stat because it's it's both offensive and defensive and it gives you bonuses or penalties of course if you have low dex and to your armor class so if you have high dexterity you are more difficult to hit to be hit and it also influences the offensive um, part of dexterity is that it influences your ranged thaco but it doesn't influence your ranged damage so that's how it's different from strength and it also influences thief skills. Uh, when you have high dexterity, for example, you get some bonuses to, to thieving skills. Uh, and that's pretty much it. When it comes to constitution, uh, it generally influences the amount of hit points that you, you're going to get as a bonus as you level up. If you go um, above 14, you get uh, hit point bonuses. So for example, at 15, we would get plus one hit point per level. Um, it also, uh, at, at Constitution 20, you actually start getting regen. You can actually regenerate uh, hit points over time. 
And at 20 it's it's pretty slow, but it's still very, very useful in Baldur's Gate 1, and I'm going to talk more about that once we recruit Kagan, who has 20 constitution. So you can even regen health points. And also another thing that constitution affects is your uh, fatigue, like how quickly you get fatigued. And fatigue is a mechanic that basically influences, uh, gives you some penalties. It basically uh, gives you a penalty to your luck stat, which isn't like implemented properly in Baldur's Gate. So basically what it does is once you get fatigued, and then every four hours after that, it's a stacking debuff to your Thaco, to your damage, and to your received damage from uh, spells, for example. So you don't really want to be fatigued for too long or these uh, penalties are going to stack and uh, it's going to be really noticeable when it comes to your performance in combat. Now intelligence is a stat that influences a couple of things. Now intelligence together with wisdom in the same way they influence a substat I guess uh, called lore. And lore basically is just, you know, the knowledge of a character that the character has about the world and different stories and unique items of legend and stuff like that. So basically what it does in gameplay terms is it allows you to identify unidentified magical items just by inspecting them if you have sufficient lore. Like every magical item that requires identification has a certain lore value attached to it and then if you meet that lore value with your character inspecting it then you know what it is, it gets identified. Other than that, you have to use a spell or you have to pay a merchant to identify stuff for you. So intelligence, if you go high with intelligence, you get bonuses to your lore, and that's a one-time bonus. And if you go uh, actually below 10, you already get a one-time uh, penalty to your lore. And wisdom in that regard works exactly the same. But back to intelligence, it, uh, like I said, it also influences using some items, scrolls and wands. You need to have nine intelligence to be able to use scrolls and use wands. And um, it's especially important for wands because they're, usually wands are only available for mages, but there are also certain ones that can also be used by clerics or only by clerics. And there are also wands that can be used by everybody. So you can have your fighter, for example, uh, use a wand of sleep uh, so that uh, you know, your mage or cleric doesn't have to waste his round using that, but can actually cast a different spell. Um, and then intelligence influences some mage stuff, mage-related stuff. Um, basically, it influences your success uh, chance when scribing scrolls. It's a mechanic where you want to add a spell to your spellbook and you have a scroll of that spell. So we basically kind of like learn the spell. Uh, there's a mechanic for that where you scribe uh, the spell into your spellbook and the scroll vanishes as an effect of that. And whether you were successful or not. And then basically intelligence determines your chance to be successful at learning the spell essentially. And it also determines the amount of space that you have in your spellbook. So for example, if you have 18 intelligence, you have 18 you can basically scribe 18 level 1 scrolls and 18 level 2 scrolls um, into your spellbook. Uh, but for example, if you have 16 intelligence, you can only scribe 11 of each level. And uh, when you have 19, you, you have no limits. So you can basically scribe like uh, all the spells that are available in the game, even if there were more like 18 <laughs> uh, like level 1 spells, which I don't think is the case for almost any level. I guess if you go for level 5 actually in, in Baldur's Gate 2 with the different spell immunities as uh, different spells you would have a problem, <laughs> I guess. But anyway, one thing that people have it wrong in my opinion is when they uh, kind of want to prioritize permanent intelligence on their mages and there are some sources that say that you know you should go for the max intelligence if you're a mage and there should be no exceptions, you should go to 18 or 19 if you're a gnome. But really, when it comes to scribing scrolls and learning spells and having the space in your spellbook, like, you're going to have to temporarily buff your intelligence anyway to 24 to give yourself 100% of uh, success rate when scribing scrolls. And that also gives you unlimited space in your spellbook. So you're pretty much always going to drink some potions of genius or potions of mind focusing to guarantee that you don't waste uh, some important, important scrolls 
And just, you know, for a scribing session, you basically just temporarily buff up your intelligence and then you guarantee that everything goes well. Uh, so, permanent intelligence is actually not useful at all, in my opinion, in that regard. It just will determine how many potions of you're going to have to chug, I guess, to get to 24. Uh, so, for example, if you start at 16, you would need two potions of genius, because they uh, give plus four each to attain 24, and that's needed for 100% uh, success rate when scribing scrolls. Also, what Enhanced Edition um, introduced is actually the fact that you need certain intelligence to be able to scribe higher level sp spells. And it's usually your intelligence divided by two. So you need 18 intelligence to be able to learn level 9 spells, for example. Uh, but again, once you temporarily buff up your intelligence, you're cool. And then also another thing that's not directly influenced by intelligence, but it's also important when talking about intelligence, is the fact that in Baldur's Gate 2 we have creatures known as the Mind Flayers or Illithids, and uh, their special ability is that they, if you get hit by them, dra they drain 5 intelligence per hit, and uh, as I've mentioned before, once any of your attribute reaches, any of your attributes reaches 0, you die. So, and they drain 5 intelligence per hit, which is quite a lot. So you generally, even if you don't need intelligence for anything, you generally, I would recommend to go at least to 11, so that you can withstand 2 hits from Mind Flayers and, and still have 1 intelligence left. Or, you know, if you can, you can go up to 16, so you can have 3 hits. And of course you can, like I said, temporarily buff you up yourself with intelligence, increasing potions like Mind Focusing or Potions of Genius. But, you know, having some decent permanent intelligence, at least 11, is nice when it comes to Baldur's Gate 2, especially with SCS, because with SCS, Mind Flayers can, like, teleport around, and they see invisible, and all that, so, you know, it's, it's harder to not get hit by them. Now, Wisdom is a, is a divine uh, caster uh, st attribute, so for Druids and Priests, it matters a lot because this one actually um, influences the amount of memorization slots that they get. And again, it's an irregular pro progression, but, uh, you know, since the druids and clerics already know all of their spells, because they're granted them through the, the power of nature, I guess, for druids and, and uh, the worship of their chosen god when it comes to clerics, they already know all the spells at their disposal uh, once they can cast. Um, a certain level of spells. So they just, you know, you just choose which ones you want to have memorized. And that's a mechanic that I'm going to show once we get into the gameplay. But basically the higher wisdom you have, the more spells you can memorize uh, with each, like, rest, I guess. And uh, as I said, it also influences lore. You can get another bonus or another penalty from wisdom, depending on how high this attribute is. And it also, uh, like I said, it can influence a in pretty important conversation, and uh, especially it influences the conversation options that you get from the wish spells. Uh, the higher wisdom, you pretty much need 18 wisdom to get the best options, but it's pretty easy because there are potions of insight in the game that set your in wisdom to 18. So permanent wisdom for someone that's not a... Uh, a cleric or druid is pretty irrelevant and it's basically the dump stat of choice that you can just go as low as possible in order to have more ability points to spend on like different attributes. And then finally charisma. It's kind of uh, in a way the least important stat in the whole game. It influences different um, like how successful certain dialogue options are and it's going to influence the reaction of uh, uh, that other characters have uh, to you. And generally the, this whole reaction thing is kind of like a sub mechanic that it uh, takes in, into account your charisma, your reputation, and um, a random number between 8 and 12. But I think it's actually a static number, at least in the Enhanced Edition. It's actually 10, I think. And generally the tests are inconclusive somewhat, sometimes, and it doesn't really matter all that much. But um, also when it comes to reputation, I think the, the influence of reputation to the reaction only starts out at like 15 or 16, something like that. Anyway, <laughs> the point is, if you have high charisma, sometimes you can 
convince other character to do something or you can squeeze a little bit more information out of them or you can get a better outcome from a quest like you're going to get a bigger reward for a quest something like that so it basically influences the um, your proficiency at, at having conversations I guess and having uh, pleasant reactions from different people now also uh, gameplay mechanics wise it also influences the discounts you're going to get when buying stuff it doesn't there are no discounts or like increased prices when it comes to selling stuff but when it comes to buying uh, reputation and charisma can provide you with some discounts if they are high enough uh, so uh, when it comes to charisma the benefits end at level 20 so you there's pretty much no benefit at all in the game I think by going over 20 because I don't think any uh, conversations need that high charisma higher than 20 and then you also get the maximum discounts at charisma at 20 so you know some popular values that you might consider for setting your charisma might be uh, for example uh, 13 because with the tome of charisma that you get in uh, in Baldur's Gate 1 this is going to increase to 14 and then you have a friend's spell that gives you a temporary plus 6 which will place you at 20 so that's um, an option that you can go for and generally it's really easy and especially in Baldur's Gate 1 to get high charisma when you need it you can either have like a charismatic companion and you can just temporarily switch them to the leader spot to take advantage of their charisma but even if you don't want to do that especially in Baldur's Gate 2 there's a ring uh, of human influence that sets your charisma to 18 and it's available very very early in the game so you know although it is kind of an inconvenience to either have to keep the ring on or just keep switching it when you need it but you know it's it's easy to get and then there are certain um, especially in Baldur's Gate 2 but in Baldur's Gate 1 as well there's a nymph cloak that gives you a plus two charisma so if you have 18 with that cloak you are at 20 already again there's also blade of roses and a long sword that gives you charisma in um, Baldur's Gate 2 so you know it's it's pretty pretty easy to get uh, to get charisma All right so actually let's revert a little bit and go into thief because I would also like to show you the see you can't be lawful good if you're a thief um, show you the, the thieving skills oh uh, we're a dwarf so we can only have 17 and then we go into skills and as you can see there's a couple of different skills uh, hide in shadows and move silently I think in the you know pen and paper they're supposed to be different but when it comes to mechanics in the enhanced editions at least they are exactly the same and they influence how well you can hide in, in shadows and uh, remain hidden in shadows because that was kind of like the the difference that they were supposed to have and I think in the classics it was always better to to max out move silence silently instead of hide in shadows um, because I think it also influenced uh, when stealth was broken you actually uh, remain hidden for a little bit of time and I think move silently influenced that so it was better to pump that up uh, but I think in the enhanced edition there were many tests and uh, it seems like they are exactly the same and basically each point in move silently and each point in hide and shadows increases your percentage chance of hiding and remaining hidden by half a per half a percent so basically you have to have a hundred and move silently and a hundred and hide in shadows to basically have a hundred percent chance to hide in shadows or like indoors but really you want to kind of go to 200 in both or at least like 170 in both because there are certain things like you know if you're in broad daylight and you're not in a shadow and stuff like that they will actually uh, there will there will be penalties to your hiding in shadows in such circumstances anyway I don't know why I started with those Detect Illusion is actually a very underrated skill which I'm going to showcase in Baldur's Gate 2 and it uh, allows the thief to uh, dispel different illusions and invisibility effects um, uh, without the usage of like you know any resources pretty much you just kind of detect illusion and it will trigger um, every round like a detection check will go off and basically uh, most of these thieving skills cap at level 100 
like when you go up to 100. And this uh, basically, in a lot of skills, it means their percentage success rate, so that would mean we have 45% chance of detecting each illusion, because they're checked separately. Um, and then, for example, when it comes to... we actually can go down to set traps, we actually have a 10% chance of successfully setting a trap. <laughs> and um, if we don't uh, successfully set a trap, but fail at it, there's also a 10% chance that we're not going to have uh, that trap backfire at us. So, you know, before you get to setting traps, you have to um, invest some skill points. But anyway, the utility of a thief usually is in, in here. Uh, let, let's talk about open locks and find traps, because those are just universally kind of the most important um, skills, although you can be perfectly fine without any of those if you know the game well. But anyway, open locks just uh, opens your lock picking. You can open doors and you can open different containers, and it's mostly just to get bonus loot, but it's it's useful in, in many situations. And you actually don't have to go up to 100, you can be at 95 and um, and still be successful, and I think I'm going to explain that more once once we get into the gameplay, because this video is super long already. And I really need to like wrap this up, <laughs> if anyone is supposed to watch through all this. Uh, but yeah, it influences your lockpicking, so you can just open locked stuff, unless it needs a specific key or like you know some plot device that opens uh, it. Uh, and find traps. It also, uh, besides finding, it also allows you to disarm traps, and that's usually very important in a playthrough. Um, Every trap, of course, has a different value for finding it and uh, disarming it. And generally, uh, being around 80 is fine for most of the game. There's a few traps that require 100, and they are mostly in Durlag's Tower. Um, but yeah, 100 is again the max pretty much needed. Same with open locks. And uh, detect illusion and set traps, they all max out at 100 and uh, then move silently and hide in shadows and pickpocketing uh, can actually go higher and we'll talk about pickpocketing in a second uh, but just finishing off finding traps it's, it's what you think you know it allows you to detect traps on the ground or on, on containers or on doors and to disarm them but if you know the game well enough and you know where all the traps are and what they do you can, you know, basically be fine without it. You can avoid the traps or just tank through them or protect yourself against the different effect that the, the traps try to, uh, you know, put on you. So, but, you know, generally the thief utility is in open locks and find traps. It's kind of that most players like, I guess, or, or need maybe, if, especially on your first couple of playthroughs, I guess. And pickpocketing, it allows you to steal stuff. Um, and basically the higher you go, the more successful you're going to be because, um, well, that's obvious, but what I wanted to emphasize here is that um, different people that you try to st steal from are going to have a different, like, tolerance for, uh, or like a different pickpocketing skill that's needed to grant you that 99% success rate, because I don't think it's changed in the classic games, no matter how high you, you buffed up your pickpocketing, and that's the same with Move Silently and uh, Hide in Shadows. There's always that 1% chance that you will fail, and I don't think Enhanced Edition changed any of that, so... But yeah, there are, of course, uh, characters that are more difficult to steal from, and there are some easy targets that you don't really need too much pickpocket to have a good chance of stealing stuff. So once we're done with here, we enter the proficiencies, and I think that's the last big topic that I would like to address. I kind of wanted to talk about every uh, weapon category and all the styles. Alright, so let's talk about the weapons. Um, as you can see, there are five possible proficiency points that you could spend on a weapon, but um, you can only go above two if you're a fighter of some sort. You can get the Mastery, High Mastery and Grand Mastery as uh, a fighter. Any other class can at most be specialized or only proficient. So anyway, when you have one uh, 
one uh, a proficiency point put into it, your proficiency, and that means that you don't have any penalties. And the penalties depend on the class. Like, mages have the most severe penalties to Thaco when they use a weapon that they're not proficient with. And fighters, actually, a lot of, of their uh, versatility comes from the fact that they actually don't even have to be proficient to use a weapon well, because they only get a minus two Thaco penalty to a weapon that they have no proficiency points spent in. And that uh, kind of matters in Baldur's Gate 1 still, but in Baldur's Gate 2 you can pretty much just use anything as a fighter and still be effective with it. And then uh, when you spend the second proficiency point it gives you plus one to hit and plus two damage. And also, for warriors only, so um, I'll talk about that in a second, and also you get half of an attack per round with that selected weapon. That's a very important point, that specialization point. Uh, because, you know, plus one to hit, plus two to damage, that's already quite nice. And then that half of an attack, that's only for warriors. What that means, uh, as a reminder, the warrior classes are fighters, barbarians, paladins, and rangers. And uh, only they can get the advantage from getting that uh, extra half of an attack per round. Um, so, for example, if you are a swashbuckler, which is a thief kit, you can also get specialization in melee weapons, but you will not get that half of an attack, because you're a thief. So that specialization, that second point that you can put into certain weapons, melee weapons as a swashbuckler, well, it's, it's not like a full second point, because you're not going to get that extra half of an attack. And we're going to talk about like rounds and attacks per rounds, probably somewhere once we get to the gameplay. And it's pretty self-explanatory. The game is just generally based on the you know, AD and D mechanic uh, about uh, based on like dice rolls and rounds uh, because it's generally a turn-based system. But Baldur's Gate is real time with pausing. But anyway, a mastery is also a quite uh, important point because that gives you another plus two to hit and plus one to damage, so that's really nice. Uh, then high mastery is kind of lackluster because it gives you plus one to damage and minus one to speed factor, which is generally a kind of a completely not significant, pretty much. Basically what speed factor is, is it determines how fast you can do your first attack in a round. Uh, and if you have a lot of attacks per round, that, that attack is going to happen fast anyway, because the game has to fit all of your attacks in that round. So if you have five attacks per round, which is the max, you know, you're pretty much going to have to uh, start attacking immediately anyway, after you know, getting in range of your target, in order for the game to be able to fit those five attacks in the six second uh, time slot that a round is in our real time. And also when you get uh, weapons that are magically enchanted, their enchantment level also reduces speed factor. So for example, a longsword plus two also uh, grants you a minus two to your speed factor. So it's really not not that important. It's kind of might be important with the two-handed weapons at the low levels of, uh, you know, Baldur's Gate one, where you only have like one attack or one and a half attacks per round, and then it it kind of matters sometimes who attacks first or like how quickly you can attack after you get in range of of your target. That's not really that big of a deal. And then Grand Mastery is of course the the main thing to go fighter for because it gives you yet another plus one damage, like minus two to speed factor, whatever, and also gives you another half of an attack, so you get, for Grand Mastery, in total, one extra attack per round with that selected weapon. And Grand Mastery is different in Icewind Dale Enhanced Edition. It actually gives you an additional extra attack, so in total you get one and a half. And in the classic Baldur's Gate 2, I think it actually didn't give you that extra half of an attack. So there were different mods to set it how you liked it. Uh, but yeah, that's it. And when it comes to the whole saga playthrough, let's just briefly talk about the different types of weapons. And when it comes to the full saga, like Bastard Swords, uh, they're a decent type of weapon to choose, but they're not really that greatly spread out throughout the saga, especially in Baldur's Gate 2. I really don't understand why there isn't uh, like a bastard sword on par with uh, a lot of other weapons, and then they have two good bastard sword swords uh, later on in the game, pretty much like five minutes away from each other. Once you get to the Underdark, uh, you can get a bastard sword plus two with bleed on it. It's called Jor the Bleeder uh, from a certain like dude, 
and then like five minutes later you encounter another guy from whom you can get a plus three bastard sword with fire damage on it. So, well, of course, you can get uh, from the first level of Watcher's Keep, you can get the unupgraded Fobane, but it's it's kind of, you know, still just kind of a basic plus three bastard sword at that point, especially since I think the implementation of those extra planner creatures that it's supposed to affect is not perfect, and there are actually mods to fix that. But I mean, this is a decent kind of weapon, but there's not too many of those bastard swords, and I think it com comes from the fact that, at least in Baldur's Gate 1, uh, that in the classic Baldur's Gate 1, these uh, weapon proficiency groups were, weren't actually so specific. Like, you had great swords that uh, consisted of bastard swords and two-handed swords together, or you had small swords that included daggers and short swords in it. So the proficiency groups were broader in the classic Baldur's Gate 1, and here we have to specialize more. Anyway, long swords are very common, very good... Uh, very good choice for the whole saga. In Baldur's Gate 1, you very early can get access to one of the best weapons in the whole game, Varscona, which is a plus two longsword with cold damage on it. And then in Baldur's Gate 2, there's also a lot of different longswords to choose from, with your ultimate weapon being Angurvadal, which is a very good weapon. And short swords are kind of lackluster a little bit, although it has to be said that you can get a plus two short sword in Baldur's Gate 1 very early, and then even can get a plus three short sword late in the game. Um, but when it comes to Baldur's Gate 2, there's really... there's a lot of utility short swords that give you an immunity to a certain effect or something like that. But um, when it comes to main hand weapons, short swords are kind of lackluster, and there are mods that introduce uh, different short swords that are tailored towards thieves and, for example, provide, like, better backstab multiplier or something. But in the unmodified game in that regard, short swords... You know, just a general remark, you're gonna be fine with anything, <laughs> pretty much. So, but, you know, just just to note, you know, the advantages of, and disadvantages of each group, well, it has to be said that short swords are kind of... You know, there, there's not a great short sword in any of the games. Well. Especially on Baldur's Gate 2, like, there's no ultimate weapon, like, your ultimate weapon is not too impressive. When it comes to axes, again, a decent choice, although you get your plus two axe in Baldur's Gate 1 kind of late after unlocking Baldur's Gate City. And then in Baldur's Gate 2, the ultimate weapon, the axe of unyielding, I don't really like it too much as an ultimate weapon, but it's a, it's a decent one. And also, at the start of Baldur's Gate 2, there's actually like, a lot of great axes. There are ranged opportunities uh, for that, because there are thrown axes. Um, and, you know, you have Stonefire, you have Frost Reaver, there, there's a lot of great axes, like, in Shadows of Am. I'm going to talk about the two-handed weapons in a second. Now, katanas, there are... You, you even get this warning here, like, magical katanas are very rare in Baldur's Gate. That's indeed the case in the unmodded game. There's uh, just one plus one katana in Baldur's Gate 1, and um, even the non-magical katanas are very rare. And it, I think it's actually kind of a bad choice for a whole saga playthrough, but I've done <laughs> playthroughs with katana because of their flavor. Uh, but generally, when it comes to the balance, katanas suffer because their base damage is 1d10, so it's uh, that of a two-handed sword, basically. And katanas usually, because of that, suffer from a lower enchantment level. And also in Baldur's Gate 2, you either are overpowered with katanas or underpowered, pretty much. Or like, for... Yeah, it's difficult to, to talk about balance and stuff, like I said before. But just for my personal liking, like, you're either... You either have, like, a too powerful weapon or kind of a lackluster, weak-ish weapon. In Baldur's Gate 2, there's Celestial Fury, which is such a powerful weapon because of the stun uh, on hit on it. You can trivialize so many encounters, like you can just, you know, uh, immobilize uh, different opponents that are not immune to stun and then just, you know, the fight is over at that point. But in Throne of Ball, you know, you're pretty much limit to, to, limited to uh, Hindo's Doom, which is a plus four katana with like nothing interesting on it. You only have it to cast like greater restoration from it pretty much. So, there, there are, like, problems with katanas. Now, scimitar, 
Wakizashi and Ninja Ninjato is a, is a pretty broad category that's very good for the entire saga, especially if you want to kill Drizzt in Baldur's Gate 1, you can get two plus three enchanted scimitars. And then in Baldur's Gate 2, there's also, um, you know, many options, especially added with uh, Wakizashi's and Ninjato weapons. Like, you can have Spectral Brand, of course, as your ultimate weapon, but even early on, from level 1 Watcher's Keep, you can get Usuno's Blade, which is, a, I think, a Wakizashi plus 4, uh, which is a, a very good, like, you know, starting weapon, although it's pretty bland. Um, yeah, and then, of course, there are offhand weapons, like Belm and, you know, Scarlet Ninjato for, like, Fighter Thieves and, and stuff. There, there's just many options. And some mods actually break this category, um, because it doesn't make all that much sense. I think they add Wakizashis together with short swords and um, yeah, and ninjatos. I think star stay with scimitars. Uh, just to you know, kind of buff up the short sword category, I guess. And and this is just such a broad category that uh, you know it's very solid for the whole saga. Daggers. Well, it's mostly about throwing daggers. <laughs> if you go to daggers, they. The melee daggers, melee focused damage, uh, melee focused daggers. I'm like, really, it's been two hours of me talking. I'm losing my voice and I'm losing my concentration. So, please forgive me if I ramble and not so coherent. But you know, just bear with me here. It's, it's gonna end. <laughs> it's gonna be over soon. <laughs> Although, oh my God, we still have to talk about my characters a little bit. But anyway, when it comes to daggers. You know, again, it's supposed to be kind of like a backstabbing weapon of choice, but... You know, there's quite a few daggers in Baldur's Gate 2 with different types of effects. But uh, it's mostly about throwing daggers, really. Throwing daggers are actually a surprisingly powerful weapon. And a lot of people don't know about that, I feel. Um, because they give you two base attacks per round. And they actually receive uh, da damage bonuses from strength. So that is really, really nice when it comes to throwing daggers. And of course in Baldur's Gate 2 you have really powerful thrown daggers. You can have the boomerang dagger very early, pretty much immediately, and in, in after exiting the first dungeon. You can pickpocket that. And then of course later on you can get the really great fire tooth plus three with that fire damage on it. And uh, But anyway, speaking of daggers in, in Baldur's Gate 1, actually another thing that I, f I feel like uh, maybe some people are not aware of is that actually a melee dagger, a dagger of venom, is actually one of the most damaging melee weapons in the whole game. Although it is a dagger, it has a poison on hit uh, that allows for a saving throw, but still, uh, that poison is actually a really good source of damage, and uh, through that, uh, the, the dagger of venom is actually a very good damaging weapons in uh, weapon in Baldur's Gate 1. But generally, when it comes to like you know backstabbing with daggers, their low base damage just kind of clinches it. That they're just not an impressive weapon. But you know whatever, you can go for it for flavor if you want to play a backstabbing thief using daggers or something. Uh, Warhammers, that's a great uh, choice for the whole saga. In Baldur's Gate One, you can get. Uh, one of the best weapons in the whole game, Ashidina, which is a plus two Warhammer with um, electricity damage on it. You can get it quite early. And then in Baldur's Gate 2, uh, of course your ultimate weapon is going to be Krom Fair, which is an incredible weapon. Um, there is a little bit of a power dip, I guess, in Shadows of Am, where you can get... you, you pretty much still stick with Ashidina, or um, Borox Fist, I think it's called. The, basically the same weapon, just a different name. Or you can get the plain old, like, plus three hammer of thunder thunderbolts. So there is kind of like a little power dip, but then, you know, at, at the end of Shadows of Am, you can already forge your, your ultimate weapon, and that's one of the, you know, most powerful weapons in the whole saga. And clubs might sound like, uh, you know, like this basic weapon that uh, shouldn't be too impressive, but actually, uh, they're really good. That's actually a viable choice for the whole saga. Very viable, actually. Because in Baldur's Gate 1, I think it's thanks to uh, Enhanced Edition, and there's also a club added by the uh, the NPC project, there's actually a plus two... There are some plus two club, clubs 
I'm like stumbling over my own words now. There are some really decent clubs in Baldur's Gate 1. And um, in Baldur's Gate 2, there are some really good clubs. The Nasher and Black Blood. And then of course you can get the Club of Detonation, which might be a little inconvenient, but it's still a very powerful club. Um, and Spears and Halberds are two-handed. Now, Flails and Morning Stars, this is something that, again, sometimes mods break this into... Uh, they basically bring Morning Stars over to Mace and leave Flails alone. That is a, also a very, very good uh, option for the whole saga, because thanks to the Enhanced Edition, it actually adds a plus two Flail um, available to buy in Sorcerer's Sundries once you unlock Baldur's Gate City. And of course, in Baldur's Gate 2, you have the incredibly powerful Flail of Ages. So, it's like not 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 much to say here when it comes to flails and morning stars. That's just a very good um, category or a type of weapon to commit to when it comes to a full saga playthrough. And then you have maces, which are a little underwhelming. Although in Baldur's Gate One Enhanced Edition, we have the stupefier, which is stupidly good, and I'm not going to use it because it comes with 25% chance to stun and it doesn't allow for a saving throw. Like, very, very good idea. It was nerfed, actually, in 2.0 and down to 10%. And I think it also allows for a saving throw, I'm not sure about, on that, but... Anyway, maces are kind of underwhelming, like in Baldur's Gate 2, there's... There's Stormstar, but there's... And there are some, like, plus three, there's, there's the Skull Crasher, or however it's called, but that's only in the Underdark. It's kind of underwhelming. You have the situational mace of disruption, of course, but like I said, it, it's a very situational weapon. You don't have to, you know, commit to maces to um, make great use of that. So it's kind of underwhelming, but it's still, uh, you know, crushing damage, which is pretty much the best type of damage. And while we're on this topic, uh, there are, there's a couple of different types of physical damage. There's uh, piercing, slashing, crushing, and uh, missile damage. And uh, crushing is pretty much the best type of damage. Crashing comes from blunt weapons, slashing comes from like, you know, swords and axes, and um, piercing is something that uh, daggers and short swords do. Um, but some weapons have like half and half. For example, halberds deal um, slashing and piercing damage, depending on which one gives... Uh, halberds are here. Oh. <laughs> I can't even see anymore. Uh, <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, depending on which type of damage would do more damage, uh, uh, they basically choose between their slashing and piercing type. Um, but anyway, crashing is pretty much the best one because of a couple of factors. Um, th that's the type of damage that uh, creatures are generally the least resistant to. There are some creatures that actually need crashing damage, like clay golems. And also, this is the type of damage that different types of armors generally don't have benefits against. So, for example, when we're talking about like a full plate armor, it has a certain ar armor class, and, but it has bonuses against slashing and piercing. And only splint mail, and I think uh, one dragon armor in Baldur's Gate 2, actually have bonuses against crushing damage. And other than that, uh, crushing damage is like pretty much the least. Um, I mean, the most likely to hit, because, um, like I said, the least amount of armors have actually bonuses um, to armor class against that type of damage. And uh, now let's talk about the two-handed melee weapons. Two-handed sword, very good option, you know, they're common, there are great examples of two-handed swords in both games. In Baldur's Gate 1, of course, you get the um, Spider's Bane, which is a plus two sword with a great immunity on it. Uh, you can also get a plus three plain, plain plus three two-handed sword in Durlag's Tower. And then of course in Baldur's Gate 2 you have the uh, unforgettable Lilarkor. And uh, there, there's a lot of options, although uh, there, there might be a little bit of a power dip, I guess, uh, when it comes to two-handed swords, like near the end of Shadows of Am before you get to some really cool stuff from Throne of Ball, but, well, it's it's still a great uh, thing to pick up. In general, most two-handed weapons, like all two-handed weapons, except for spears, are really good for a whole saga playthrough. 
So next one is Spear, and unfortunately Spears suffer from low base damage when it comes to two-handed weapons, and just not a good variety um, of just uh, magical Spears that would do something interesting or powerful. There are mods that kind of fix that, and uh, also when it comes to the spread out of Spears, in Baldur's Gate 2 there are actually some powerful Spears, I have to say especially the Impaler, but it's again the same thing as with uh, Bastard Swords. I don't know why they didn't spread out the weapons a little bit better, because uh, once you finish Spell Hold, you know, you get access to the Impaler, which is a very powerful spear, and then pretty much five minutes later you can buy Spear of Withering. That's a plus four spear that's also pretty good, but at least I can, that I can understand, because Impaler is easily missable. I guess you can skip that part of content that would give you the Impaler. Uh, halberds are like one of my favorites, I think, when it comes to two-handed weapons. There's a really good variety in both games and very powerful examples of halberds. Like you can get a um, plus two halberd in Baldur's Gate 1, which is pretty much, you know, in, in most cases, um, most types of weapons, as good as you can get. And then in Baldur's Gate, through, there's a re uh, Baldur's Gate 2, there's a really good variety of halberds where um, you know, you can, you can buy the Harmonium Halberd that gives you plus, plus one strength, which if you have 18 uh, with any like exceptional strength, pretty much going up to 19 is a, is a really cool, pretty big upgrade, depending on your exceptional strength. Um, then you have the Halberd uh, from Patrick that has cold damage on it. And then, of course, once you get to Underdark, you get the Dragon's Breath, I think it's called, with all of the five elements on it. On hit, and then you have the Ravager, of course, in Throne of Ball. So it's it's like, really, you have these uh, cool different um, types of halberds. Like you can use the Harmonium halberd as your go-to halberd, but if you want to hit a mage through a Stone Skin, you can go to the Cold Damage halberd. And you know, it's just like they're they're spread out well. Also, uh, an important part. You know, it's just really cool. And quarter staves again. It might seem like it's supposed to be some kind of lowly mage weapon that some old mage is just trying to hold on to <laughs> in order to like keep walking. But quarter staves are actually some of the best weapons, uh, especially in some situations. Like you wouldn't believe, but actually quarter staves are one of the best weapons to backstab with. And how you backstab with like a blunt quarter stab? Well, don't ask me, but the creators <laughs> of the system. But basically how it works is that, you know, thieves can use quarter staves, and any uh, weapon that thieves can use, uh, you know, as a base, kind of, um, that they're not restricted, I guess, from using, um, they can backstab with. So <laughs> pretty much every quarter staff they can backstab with. And there are some really good ones. Uh, in Baldur's Gate 1 you can buy yourself a plus three staff pretty early if you go for that. Um, there are also other uh, weapons that use that proficiency, like you have a uh, Staff Spear, I think, and Staff Mace. I think they use Quarter Staffs. And um, you also have Staff of Striking, which is uh, powerful in certain situations, especially for backstabs. But even if you want to you know, just, you know, like, have it uh, usable for some encounters to just generally deal damage with, you of course can save it for, for a few encounters where you really want to dish out the max damage. And of course in Baldur's Gate 2, again, you have Staff of Striking. You have the Staff of Rin, which is again a s staff that you can purchase early on that has a really good enchantment because it has a plus four enchantment. And then of course you can get the Staff of the Ram and then upgrade it and just dish out really good amounts of damage. And I'll just talk about the ranged weapons. Actually, you have to... Oh yeah, crossbows are the first one. Uh, there are some good crossbows in both games. Like you can have, you can buy from Baragost, um, or in Baragost, you can buy the crossbow of speed that gives you an additional attack. Uh, there's also the crossbow of accuracy if um, you help the druids in Cloakwood. Uh, then in Baldur's Gate City, you get attacked by a guy that has that crossbow. And in Baldur's Gate 2, there's of course Firetooth, again the same name, but uh, it's a it's a crossbow that you can even later upgrade, uh, which is an incredible crossbow, especially if you uh, use ammunition with it. Uh, 
because it generates its own ammunition, but actually if you use ammunition with it, you just get pretty incredible damage with it. So really, when it comes to having an archer in Baldur's Gate 2, crossbows are basically where it's at. Uh, longbow... It's a really good choice for Baldur's Gate 1, but not really, not so much for Baldur's Gate 2. When it comes when it comes to uh, Baldur's Gate 2 in general, a lot of the projectiles were nerfed, like arrows and crossbow bolts. But some of them are still powerful, but they generally deal way less damage. And when it comes to longbows, um, they just there's just nothing any uh, there's just nothing too powerful about them. There's no damage like with the crossbows, or fire tooth. And there's no additional attacks, like with the short bow, twig and bow, which we're going to talk about in a second. So longbows are really, really good in Baldur's Gate 1. You can get the composite longbow plus one, you can buy that really early, which is pretty much the best bow in the game. And then you can still early get the longbow of marksmanship. So good choice, but not so much for Baldur's Gate 2 in general. And short bows... Um, they are decent in Baldur's Gate 1. You can get the uh, short bow plus 2 later on. And uh, of course, short bows plus 1. Like, I don't even remember. There, there are plus 1 and plus 2 <laughs> examples in Baldur's Gate 1. And of course, in Baldur's Gate 2, you have the Twigan bow, which gives you an additional attack per round, which is great. And then you have the short bow of Gessen, uh, which uh, generates highly enchanted uh, projectiles of its own if you need that to uh, be able to hit certain certain creatures. Now darts are actually an underrated uh, thrown weapon. They deal low base damage, but that's not what's great about darts. Darts, uh, although the range is shorter than most ranged weapons, they have a base of three attacks per round, and there's actually quite a few darts that have great effects on them. There are darts of wounding and darts of stunning, especially. And uh, they are very good to, to just take advantage of those properties. But maybe not so much commit to darts as your main weapon, but, you know, you're gonna be fine. And with slings, those are decent weapons as well in, in both uh, Baldur's Gates. Uh, especially since they get, uh, again, a, a bonus to damage from strength, actually. And there are some highly enchanted slings, basically, in both games, so it's, it's, uh, it's a decent type of weapon. Actually, a very good type of ranged weapon, really, if, especially when it comes to some projectiles that are available for it. Alright, and now let's talk about the weapon styles. These weapon styles, by the way, only affect melee weapons. They do nothing when it comes to ranged weapons. So you would think that a two-handed weapon style would affect uh, longbows, but it doesn't. It only works on melee weapons. So the two-handed style... Basically... The styles accept two weapon style, where you can have three points invested in it. Uh, these three, uh, all the other styles basically, only can go up to two points. And usually when it comes to weapon styles, in my opinion, the last point is not worth it. And well, the sword and shield style in general is not worth it, but let's talk about uh, the two-handed style. So the one point of it is great, because of course you get plus one damage uh, through that and some minus to uh, speed factor so it actually you know makes you hit or make that attack quicker i guess and uh, but basically the main thing about it is that you can score a critical hit not only on a 20 like normally but also on a 19 so you double your crit chance from essentially five percent to ten percent which is nice and then the second point is just a further minus two bonus to speed factor it's like never go into that <laughs> pretty much it's pretty useless now when it comes to short, sword and shield, this is debatably like the worst style. Uh, you can, like it says, you can use any weapon, it doesn't have to be a sword, but it's basically for shield users. In Baldur's Gate 1 you can actually debate, you can actually have an argument that it's pretty good, because in Baldur's Gate 1 there are some really dangerous archers, especially with SCS. Those Black Talon elites will just ruin your day. So here you just get, for each point, you get a... Uh, a bonus of two to armor class. This minus two here might confuse you. It's the same with Thaco. The lower you are, the better. Um, the lower AC and the lower Thaco you have, the better they are, actually. It was changed in the third edition, where you have the base attack bonus go up and your armor class go up, but here they, they go down, and that makes them better. Uh, the single weapon style, 
Uh, here again, the first point gives you a bonus of one to armor class, and again, the crits, which is great. And the second point, I guess if you're going for like flavor or something, you know, it just basically gives you another point to armor class, which is pretty unimpressive. So again, I would just stick to one point. And then with two weapon style, you can have a maximum of three points, and I would still go without the last one. But anyway, um, in order to, uh, to use two weapons, this is basically dual wielding, I guess, is the more common name for that kind of thing, is that you can have two weapons, one in each hand. And uh, in, in order to not have these penalties to your main hand weapon, you need to invest two points into that, so that uh, the wielder's penalties are reduced to zero with the main weapon. And then you have a minus four penalty to your Thako with the offhand weapon, but uh, and which is reduced to minus two with the third point. That's all it does. It just increases your offhand Thako uh, by two. And I generally it's not worth it because um, you can the max amount of attacks per round that you can have is five. And then of course if you use improved haste you can double that. But generally you can have five attacks, and only one of those attacks is going to be your offhand weapon attack. So it's generally not really worth it to invest a whole proficiency point, especially depending on your class, because you know certain combos like you know a fighter dual class to a mage. Like once you're a mage, you're not going to get a lot of uh, proficiency points to spend. So it's generally not worth it, in my opinion, to go for that third one, because like I said, your offhand weapon is usually going to be some kind of a stat stick or a speed weapon. And, um, you know, just having slightly better Thaco with, for that one attack per round is just not a great deal, in my opinion. So anyway, let's, let's uh, just... As you could see, uh, as a thief, I can only have proficient at one point in um, any weapon style. Now when it comes to appearance, you can customize the colors and stuff. There's actually more colors to choose from if you edit your save. Uh, which is something that I've done for my characters, which I'll show you, which I'm going to show you in a second. And there's also, aside from this major and minor color, there's also three other types of colors called leather, armor, and um, metal. And they influence like uh, different, like smaller parts of your uh, your look. And you can also edit that through editing your save, like through Shadow Keeper or EE Keeper in the enhanced editions. And of course, the hair. Let's be a well. Th this guy. <laughs> doesn't look like a dwarf really but whatever and then you ca can customize the voice and whatever and then the name all right holy so now that we are done with all this let me just show the two characters I'm going to play as uh, <laughs> in my playthrough so you can just do this start over import character file my main character the protagonist of this story uh, and my basically like my favorite go-to character that I've had in various incarnations is uh, Senashira, this Kensai. Uh, as you can see, if you're familiar with the game, and uh, I even mentioned that, Kensai normally cannot be chaotic, but like I said, that's my favorite alignment. It doesn't affect anything in the game. Uh, so I just allowed myself to have this little like quote-unquote illegal thing about it. Uh, well, gameplay mechanics, she's going to be a mage later on. So, uh, what familiar you get as a mage is dependent on your alignment. So, chaotic good gets a, f a fairy dragon, um, and like lawful good and neutral good get a pseudo dragon. But it doesn't really matter. Fairy dragon is like slightly better in my opinion because it has an AOE invisibility spell, uh, which I'm probably not going to cast more than maybe once or twice. Uh, probably because. You know, in Baldur's Gate 2, when, when she's going to transition into Mage, we're going to have a lot of different ways of being invisible and whatever. And so first of all, she's a human because I'm going to dual class her, like I said. Uh, she's a Kensai, starts out as a Kensai. And uh, in Baldur's Gate 2, once she reaches level 9 in Kensai, I'm going to dual class her into a Mage, which is a very powerful combination, and that's why she's going to have probably some spell restrictions, so that it's not too ridiculous. But with SCS, you know, there's a lot of opponents that are multi-classes and dual classes, so I feel like, you know, this is, isn't that big of a deal. And especially since we get to suffer in Baldur's Gate 1 as a Kensai, in order to receive that reward, <laughs> I guess, in uh, Baldur's Gate 2. Because when it comes to Kensai, the class actually cannot use any armor, cannot use helmets, and cannot use bracers. 
So the armor class, the, the basic armor class, I guess, of the Kensai, is going to be pretty bad, and the lack of helmets is going to be very dangerous, because helmets um, protect you from being critically hit. And critically, critical hits do double damage, and as a melee Kensai, well, you know, you're, you're susceptible to critical hits. You're vulnerable to that, so we can get struck by double damage at any point, pretty much. And I said melee Kensai, because um, Kensai are, are supposed to only be melee, they cannot use ranged weapons, but there's a certain uh, thing to be said there, but we're going to discuss that uh, when I talk about my second character, because that's actually going to be a pretty cool concept. Anyway, the Kensai is a class much like the Archer, which is the Ranger Kit Archer. Um, are kind of were introduced by Baldur's Gate 2 and are kind of meant to be at a high level to really come into their own because uh, they get stacking bonuses as you go higher in level. So every three levels a Kensai gets plus one taco and plus one damage. And that's nice. Uh, on higher levels those those bonuses are going to be noticeable for sure. But of course at low level we have none of that. And that's the thing in Baldur's Gate 1. We basically have almost none of the benefits of a Kensai. The Kensai also has an ability called Kai, but without too many attacks per round. Uh, the uh, It also de depends on the weapon. I'm going to talk about that more later once we go into the gameplay. But it's not like that great in Baldur's Gate 1. So basically, as a Kensai, we uh, pretty much get none of the advantages of a Kensai. But, when it comes to disadvantages, we're going to feel the full force of these disadvantages, because not having armor and, and a helmet in Baldur's Gate 1 is a pretty big deal. Of course, there are workarounds, and I actually like having a Kensai, because you have to have a different approach to having a melee combatant that doesn't have a great armor class or permanent armor class, and there are different workarounds that you have to implement in order to, you know, have the Kensai not die and, and, you know, improve their armor class temporarily for some fights. There are spells and items that can do that. So it's kind of cool that it's not just yet another full plate guy. Um, and, yeah, I think that's that's it when it comes to the Kensai and for the class, you know, dual class combo. Uh, now let's talk about her stats. Uh, they are pretty min-maxed. Um, because I got a really high roll, I think this is a 94 total roll, which on a Kansai is re on a human Kansai it's really hard to do uh, because of the very low uh, minimum stat requirements. <sighs> Should I explain that? <laughs> like in pen and paper, these requirements for stats are actually a disadvantage because you first roll for stats, I think. Uh, but in Baldur's Gate, you first choose your class and then roll for your attributes, so they're actually a, a good thing. So, for example, as a paladin, your minimum charisma has to be 17. So when you roll your stats, your charisma is always going to be either 17 or 18. But anyway, we have good strength. We, ha we are over the 75. Uh, we are in the 75 to 90 brackets, or 76 uh, to 90 bracket. So we have a really good strength, an exceptional strength. It's going to serve us well. I've had, um, and she's going to be a melee combatant, so obviously you want to go for max. Then we have max dexterity as well, because as a Kensai, we want to get our armor class from wherever we, we can, basically, and 18 dexterity is going to provide us with a plus 4 armor class bonus. Now, constitution, we have 14, because this is as high as we can go without actually getting any HP bonuses, like I said, to kind of uh, counteract this uh, max HP thing that I'm, I'm running with. And 14 just just so that she doesn't become fatigued too early, or like too quickly. And in Baldur's Gate 1 that's kind of noticeable, because in Baldur's Gate 1 you travel a lot between areas and the travel times are pretty long. In Baldur's Gate 2 it's not a big deal at all. But anyway, uh, intelligence is at 16, because with the Tome of Intelligence we're going to get... Um, we're going to make it 17, and that is the minimum required to dual class into a mage. That's generally the requirements for dual class that I actually forgot to talk about, are 15 in your primary stat of your first class, which is strength for a Kensai, so obviously we're set there, and 17 in, in the class, um, in the primary stat of the class that you want to dual class into, and that's uh, intelligence for a mage. So we need to be at 17 to be able to dual class into a mage. And Druid is actually an exception to all that, because it actually needs two stats at 17, both wisdom and charisma. So it's actually pretty hard to roll, uh, 
you know, a great stat, uh, like Kensai Druid, for example. Anyway, um, Wisdom is at 10 because I just put all my spare points into Wisdom, and that basically ensures that we don't have a penalty to our lore, so that in Baldur's Gate 2 she's actually going to become a pretty good lore character, because one thing I forgot about lore, holy, is actually that it also depends on the class and your level. So you get some lore every level, and uh, as a bard you get 10 lore per level, as a thief and a mage you get 3 lore, and every other class gets 1. So of course bards get by far the most lore, that's kind of convenient that bards can pretty much identify everything. But you know, it's, it's not such an important stat to really go for a bard, uh, just ba based on that. But anyway, sh she's going to be a mage with 17 intelligence, that's going to give her a uh, bonus to her lore. I think that's a plus 7 bonus, and then Wisdom at 10 is actually not going to give her any penalty. And then we have Charisma at 18, because that's one of the, the main points of this playthrough when I wanted to showcase a lot of lesser known like bits and pieces and outcomes and quest rewards and stuff like that. And you pretty much need 18 Charisma right off the bat, right in Candlekeep. There's a couple of different conversation responses that you get and uh, quest reward that you get that it's better and you can convince uh, someone with 18 charisma so it's it basically has to be there and it's basically for the purpose of uh, you know just just achieving what this playthrough is supposed to achieve and now when it comes to weapon proficiencies she's going to be dual wielding warhammers like I said warhammers are a great choice for the whole saga and, and I especially like warhammers on Kensai mages because uh, once you get really far in the game like throne of ball uh, when you're a Kensai mage, your Thako, especially a, a nine level, a ninth level Kensai, and I'm going to probably talk about why level nine once we get into Baldur's Gate 2 and I actually do the dual class. Uh, especially being a ninth level Kensai, uh, that dual class is into a mage. Your Thako is going to be maybe a little bit lackluster once it comes to uh, Throne of Ball, but with that 25 strength that Chrome Fair, the, the Warhammer we're going to be using, grants us, that actually uh, alleviates that, that whole problem and uh, makes it so that we're going to be hitting our targets uh, pretty often. And I think that's all that I have to say about this character for now. And my second character is going to be this one. She's called Kirinai, uh, and uh, she's also a Kensai, which I agree that there should be a, a little bit more variety, I think, uh, with one of them being a Berserker. But I don't like Berserker Mage, and um, Berserkers are actually so f powerful in SCS because of their Berserker Rage. That's such an insane ability in, um, in uh, Baldur's Gate 1 with SCS just insane and they can wear all the armor you know it's just a great class it's a it's an insane class for for the entire saga pretty much it's, it's very good but you know let's let's suffer a bit more with those low level kensai and uh, actually she's a kensai because i wanted to really showcase a really cool concept that's i think pretty unknown which is that in Baldur's gate you can actually have a ranged kensai which uh, is going to progress to be a very damaging character Although, in Baldur's Gate 2, she's going to be a melee combatant. So anyway, she's going to dual class at level 9, again, in Baldur's Gate 2, into a thief. So she's going to be kind of a backstabbing thief, she's going to be another... Um, also, I wanted to have this character to showcase the power of Detect Illusion in Baldur's Gate 2, and to just showcase how nice backstab is to have in your repertoire. Because a lot of people seem to think that uh, just because certain bosses, pretty much, and like very few creature types are immune to backstab, that it somehow makes backstab not worth it. I mean, it's not a, a tool that you need to use in every encounter, but it's a very useful tool to use where an opportunity presents itself for it to be effective, you know? It's just a great tool to have in your arsenal. So, uh, because that kind of class, the Kensai Thief, doesn't really need a high stat total, it's very easy to roll the perfect uh, 100 in exceptional strength for a character like that. Because, like I said, she, she doesn't really need a high stat total. This is only a 81 stat total, I think. 
So she's going to be a melee combatant, and uh, in Baldur's Gate 1 she's going to be throwing daggers, which I'm going to elaborate on in a second. And uh, those get uh, a damage bonus from strength, so of course she went for maximum strength. Dexterity at 18, both for the range taco, for the throwing daggers, and also the armor class bonus. I allowed myself to give her 15 constitution instead of 14 here, and I'm going to give her the Tome of Constitution, I think. Because once she dual classes into a thief, you know, Kansai thieves are kind of squishy, and HP is pretty much her only defense, so I wanted her to be a little tougher, because, you know, Senashira, uh, the, the Kansai mage I'm gonna have, is gonna have uh, different mage protections and stuff to counterbalance that Kansai, you know, vulnerability. So I just wanted to have uh, her, you know, uh, health pool be a little, a little bigger. 11 con intelligence, so she can withstand two hits from a Mind Flayer. Wisdom is irrelevant and charisma is irrelevant, but still, even if those... I don't like playing dumb characters, pretty much, that have, like, you know, three wisdom, even if they have no use for wisdom. You know, just for kind of, like, role-playing purposes, I guess. I don't like to dump uh, any stat to such an extent. And now, when it comes to her weapon proficiencies, I need to talk about a little bit how we're going to develop that. So, first of all, the daggers. She's actually going to spend her first proficiency point at level 3 into that uh, mastery in daggers to give plus 2 thaco, or to receive plus 2 thaco and plus 1 damage to the daggers, because in Baldur's Gate 1 that's going to be her main uh, weapon. She's going to be throwing daggers. And why can a Kansai throw daggers and become a ranged Kansai, by the way? It's because how they, these weapons are implemented in Baldur's Gate. Actually, in Icewind Dale Enhanced Edition, if you want to go for that, you're not going to be possible to use a, a thrown weapon with a Kensai or a Cavalier, and I learned that the hard way, by the way, because it's just coded differently. But in Baldur's Gate, actually, because the the general weapon uh, proficiency, like a dagger or an axe, is like generally considered melee, and these thrown weapons also have a melee component, you can also use them in melee, I guess, you know, they are just usable by a Kensai. So she's going to be throwing daggers, in Baldur's Gate 1, which is going to be very effective, and that's why we're going to spend the first proficiency point into daggers. But since she's not going to be able to uh, reach Grand Mastery in Baldur's Gate anyway, so the second proficiency point is not going to go into that lackluster mastery, uh, high mastery slot. That fourth point is, you know, the, the worst one. Uh, and she's going to be preparing to actually become a melee combatant in Baldur's Gate 2. We're actually going to put that into scimitars. And then in Baldur's Gate 2, at level 9, she's going to go fourth point into scimitars, then we're going to dual class into a thief, we're going to put one point into uh, two-weapon style, and then hold off with leveling a little bit so that we can finish off Grand Mastery and two points into dual wielding once the dual class is completed. You will see what I mean once we get to that in Baldur's Gate 2. But yeah, her weapon of choice is going to be the dagger, in uh, Baldur's Gate 1, she's going to be mainly throwing daggers, but of course through the Dagger of Venom or some decent scimitars that you can get in Baldur's Gate 1. And she's actually going to be also a competent, a competent melee combatant. Well, the emphasis on all these words. Alright, so that is it, ladies and gentlemen. I think this is my spiel. This is two and a half hours long. I'm not sure how I'm going to like upload that how much time it's going to take, but anyway, you know what, let's just finish off by um, just showcasing the appearance uh, of uh, Senashira, whatever it is that, we're going to use the default voice for her, her name is going to be Senashira, and uh, let's just watch the intro, and then also later on I'm going to include, I think, the uh, the cinematic to Baldur's Gate, <laughs> just so they are included in this video, and then in episode one, we can actually go straight to the gameplay. So let's listen. Uh, well, actually, I should first do the movie, and then go into the introduction. So let's go into movies and watch the enhanced edition version of that uh, cinematic. So let's go.
as Baldur's Gate. All I can say is that the classic cinematics were better, actually, especially when the Baldur's Gate shows up. It's actually in flames and it's epic. Anyway, let's now create a new game, import our character, and uh, just listening, listen to the Candlekeep introduction, and then we will meet in episode one. So, uh, see you then. Nestled atop the cliffs that rise from the Sword Coast, the Citadel of Candlekeep houses the finest and most comprehensive collection of writings on the face of Farron. It is an imposing fortress, kept in strict isolation from the intrigues that occasionally plague the rest of the Forgotten Realms. It is secluded, highly regimented, and it is home. Within these hallowed halls of knowledge, your story begins. You have spent most of your twenty years of life within this keep's austere walls, under the tutelage of the sage Gorion. Acting as your father, he has raised you on a thousand tales of heroes and monsters, lovers and infidels, battles and tragedies. However, one story was always left untold, that of your true heritage. You have been told that you are an orphan, but your past is largely unknown. Lately, Gorion has been growing distant from you, as if some grave matter weighs heavily on his heart. You have asked about his concerns as gently as possible, but your queries have been in vain. Your sole comfort is the knowledge that he is a wise man, and you know he will tell you when the time is right. Nonetheless, his silence is troubling, and you cannot help but feel that something is terribly wrong. Today, Gorion has appeared more agitated than ever, and now he has uncharacteristically interrupted your chores in the middle of the day. Imparting hurried instructions for you to equip yourself for travel, he has handed you what gold he can spare, but given no clue as to why. Nevertheless, you now stand before the Candlekeep Inn, ready to purchase what you need for an unplanned and unexpected journey. 